A jailbreak <laughs> somewhere in the town. Right, man. Wrong song. Tonight <laughs> there's gonna be trouble. <laughs> so don't you be around. Perfect way to start the year 2024. Here we are. Good movie Monday. Hello, everybody. Glenn and Ben here. Coming at you for the first time this year. How are you, Ben? I'm good, mate. How are you? Oh, look, I'm okay. I'm exhausted. It was not the summer break I was hoping for. Let's it, put was, it, <laughs> it wasn't the summer of Glenn? <laughs> no. I We wrapped up last year and I was like on a high. I'm like, beautiful, let's have a three-month hiatus and we can regroup and come back fresh. And, and no sooner had Christmas finished and I got kicked out of my house. <laughs> got evicted. When you said that, to, when you actually <laughs> sent me the text, I thought you just had a fight with Mel and you had been kicked out. <laughs> That probably would have been better because then I, I would have like, been back in. After. And I was like, I hope he's not asking if he can stay with me because <laughs> I don't think there's room on the couch. Your armchair is pretty comfy. It is, it is, the armchair <laughs> is pretty comfy. And you fall asleep in it all the time. I do. <laughs> no, so I had to spend my entire summer looking for a new house. And here we are, new digs, new office, and I actually think it's a better one. It's a, it's a, certainly a bigger one. Oh, okay, but not better. <laughs> well, look, it, it, it is. I, it, what it is missing is mm. the big window. Ah. Yes, that's true. It doesn't have the big window. So I'm going to be curious to see mm. what your interviews and stuff are going to look like in this room ah, as already, opposed to... I have uh, already done a few, my friend. Oh, and how do they, yeah, they, how look, do they look? great. Look at this backdrop I've got. The backdrop is amazing, but the, your lights are very, very tungsten. Yeah, that is true. Like you got to have to set that... you got to have to but fill it with the white balance. If you notice, even in the old place, most of my interviews are in a dark room that I light with like that, colours. With the thing, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, so... There we go, samesies. But this feels like it, now you're in a similarly a similarly <laughs> lit room yeah. to my one, ah, which yeah, is yeah. always super dark <laughs> whenever I'm on the Zoom. Except I've got hair, so it doesn't bounce off my so head. It doesn't just, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a wig. <laughs> I have to buy a wig just for Zooms. That'd be great. Or like a fez. Oh, that'd be great. You get a shrine, a, a shrine, a hat. You can just do what I do and have the backwards baseball cap. I can't, it looks weird when you've got the, <laughs> when you do it that way. When you've just got the, the semicircle. Because then... Yeah, especially if you go out in the sun and then you tan and it looks like you've got the spiral window from uh, play school <laughs> on your forehead. <laughs> you could have a Frank Spencer beret. Yeah, <laughs> good. Apparently, uh, they're okay for wearing everywhere outside of France. But not in France. But no, that was one of the big things when I went, they're like in all the tourist guides and stuff and everything, they're saying, do not, <laughs> uh, do not wear a beret. M- mainly, I think, to women. Because French people do not wear berets. <laughs> well, we learnt that in European vacation. Vacation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so here we are, another year. We've got lots planned for this year. Well, I do anyway. I don't. Have you been looped in? And we've got a we've got a spreadsheet. You've looked at that. I look. I only saw the spreadsheet when you sent it to the boneheads, <laughs> okay. and I was like, oh, there's a lot of interviews. <laughs> there's a lot of interviews we've got coming up this year. Um, let's, I'll go through a few that we have guaranteed already in the bank. We've got Ethan Cohen of the Cohen Brothers, uh, Matthew. Vaughan. I'm really looking forward to see that film. It is Jeez. great. Have you seen it? Yes, already? I have. I had to see it to do the interview. When did that... Because they haven't had the media screening for that yet, have they? Have they had the... Uh, have they, well, have it's the, now playing theatrically, so they must have. Oh, <laughs> totally missed out on that one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's good. It's Apparently, it's a film that they spent 20 years trying to make. So, back when they were the Cohen brothers, they were trying to get it off the ground then. Because now it's, it's, it's a Cohen and his wife. Yeah, which she's been the editor on all of their films from many, many years ago. Uh, so, we've got an interview with him coming up. Matthew Vaughan of uh, Argyle, the director of Argyle. Uh, Dev Patel. You know, good old Dev Patel, uh, Robert Connolly, director. Oh, like of you said that like Dev Patel. Good old Dev Patel. Good old like, <laughs> oh yeah, my old mate, Dev Patel. I'm a, bit, I'm a bit rusty. It's been a long time since I've been on the mic, mate. Uh, Robert Connolly, director of The Dry Two, The Force of Danger. That finally got a release after all of the strike yeah. delays. Bill Bennett, legendary Australian director. Uh, Jason Blum again. Uh, Kia Roche Turner for his new uh, new movie Sting. Sting. Uh, and we've got one today. Jesse V. Johnson, an action director I've been trying to talk to for a long time. So I'm like you and I are both big fans of, of his film Avengement. Oh yes, which is the greatest, <laughs> the greatest <laughs> title for a movie ever. <laughs> no. I remember you and I having a conversation about the title about the before title, we even before saw the movie. It, yeah, <laughs> it's like fuck, 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Avengement. <laughs> what do you feel like tonight? I feel like fucking Avengement. <laughs> so that's, you know, we've got, we've got a great year. We've also got the Boneheads are back. We've got Jarrett here for his PE class. Um, we also have uh, a new member of the team. I don't know if we're going to introduce yet, but coming up in a couple of weeks' time, there's another voice to the show. I'm looking forward to that. Should we keep that mysterious for a while? Yeah, let's keep that mysterious. Excellent. What else? Just, oh. in, case, just in case it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also, big uh, heads up that Chloe and I have our show Wednesday up late. There's a few changes to that, which is very exciting. So make sure on a Wednesday night that you keep up with us. Um, heaps of fun. We're going to do a lot more live in-person stuff this year, which is exciting. But what I want to know, Ben, is what did you get up to over the summer? That's a very good question, Glenn, and I really wish I could answer it <laughs> because I don't remember any of it. I took a, I had a nice, I had a three-week holiday over the summer period. It was supposed to be four weeks, but mm. somehow work screwed me out of a week. Always does that. Uh, there somewhere. Uh, but I didn't go anywhere. I didn't really do anything. We just kind of, just kind of lazed around at home, but I didn't like accomplish any. Did you change like, pants? Define pants. <laughs> Define change. <laughs> uh, like I didn't, yeah, I didn't take on any projects. I didn't, I didn't really do. I'm really struggling to remember what I actually did <laughs> over that whole summer period. Like it is, I've got um, one of my niece's birthdays is like three days after Christmas, mm-hmm. and they went away, so we had her dog. Um, we had their, her dog. We've got a friend of my father's dog that we also had. So we had three dogs for a while, which was great. Uh, slash horrifying. <laughs> uh, especially when one of them, one of them doesn't share food. Uh. Like it has the whole resource guarding thing. Mm-hmm. So that we always have to lock him away. It's a bit like you. The other two. Like you. Oh, if you leave it on the plate, I'll take it. <laughs> but I will tell you this. I, I did, uh, I did uh, not, I did not watch the old calorie intake over the summer period. <laughs> Nor did I. So I feel like I am. <laughs> I feel like uh, the Michelin Man right now. Yeah, or like the State Puff, 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 I went there for work. Oh, okay. Funnily well, enough, it was actually we went back it for work. It wasn't pleasure. It wasn't for pleasure. We went to the Gold Coast uh, shooting behind the scenes uh, of a movie being shot there that uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to name. So and you weren't up there for the actor awards? No, I wish. Didn't get to meet Margot? I wish I would have got to meet Margot. I wish I would have got to to uh, to meet, um, uh, what's her name? The one from The Bachelor. Uh, <laughs> who's like, who's, who's, I don't know. Uh, she was on. Uh, she's the host of of F Boy Island, which oh, they. Yeah, no, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, she's got the. You know, she she has the the podcast that we that I asked you if you listen to. She's like super opinionated. I do know who you mean. I and don't know her name. I just saw her whole maths thing, which was which was hilarious. Mm. And she just did a thing on on maths. <laughs> um, I can't believe that I've completely gone <laughs> gone blank on her name. Abby. Abby. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, is, is, is Abby. Go on the <laughs> She's old. always got her tits out. She almost always does. Abby Al- Chatfield. The, almost. Abby Chatfield. That's yeah. the one. <laughs> we got there. Yeah. I saw a bit, I, so I didn't get to meet her. I didn't get to meet Melanie Bracewell, who I'd love to have met. Yep. The, the, consider, we were talking about F-Boy Island. Yeah. They, there's a whole string of F-Boy Island jokes during the After Awards, which I enjoyed. <laughs> uh, but no, it was, it was unfortunately, it was a bit after. But did I tell you about the time we were shooting uh, extras for a film called The Set? Mm-hmm. And we were shooting. We had to shoot stuff with um, uh, who was <laughs> Jesus? Now I can't remember her name. Either. Two thousand twenty four off to uh, a great yeah. start. <laughs> uh, what's it? She's like um, she's her nickname is like something like like. Oh God! <laughs> Do you remember we talked about having a third you know, person Ernie on the desk to check yeah, and look stuff yeah. up for us? Ernie Sigley's sidekick. Denise Drysdale. Oh, yeah. Ding dong. It was ding dong. That's what I was, I was, I was like. Dingly, ding, ding. Yeah. Ding dong. We were shooting stuff with her. We had to go. She was in Melbourne. And we, being the oblivious 
idiots that we are. I didn't know why. She's just like, oh, I'm coming down to Melbourne, so pick me up from my hotel. And uh, what was she and like? She was she was really nice. Like yeah. the, she, we I've were, heard good things. We were we weren't really talking to her. We were talking to this other woman who was. They were sharing a room, and they're like they're old friends. Yeah. And but then this old friend had like some kind of mild heart attack, and oh. so she took her to uh, <laughs> so. So Ding Dong took her to hospital. We picked them both up from the hospital and to go and do this wow. shoot thing. There was this whole thing, but while we were waiting for them at the at their at their hotel, mm. just sitting there watching all of these like celebrities walk past, and I'm like, like yeah, that the vet yeah, that yeah. now hosts I'm a celebrity, get me yeah, out of here, yeah, whatever yeah. that guy's name Chris. is, and Doctor Chris, Doctor Chris, and you know all these people, and we're like, what the hell? And we didn't realize, of course, that it was at Crown the night before was the Logies, and it was all of the people who had stayed God. over it. <laughs> Worse for wares. <coughs> yeah. No, yeah, so no Carl Stefanovic. No, no, this was... Had this been before the time of Carl? You know, he has nothing to do with um, movies, but I'd love to have him on a podcast like this. Yeah. Um, I like to him and his brother. Oh, they're great. <laughs> yeah. But we, we record from the backseat of a cab. <laughs> of a cab, yeah. That they're driving. <laughs> uh, so that's but what you've got shame it's, Yeah, it's a shame that the Logies don't happen in Melbourne anymore. No, it is. I it don't is. know how we lost it. I don't know how they let... they. We still have the Grand Prix, but they let the Logies slip through just, our I guess not enough people care anymore. Like, it doesn't matter where it is. It's yeah. probably cheaper up there. But um, you wouldn't believe it, but we're still in the intro of the show. So uh, just for those people that are still with us... <laughs> and what's, the, what's the name of the show again? Uh, Good Movie yeah, Monday. But right. don't forget to look us up on all the social media platforms. So Facebook is the one to go to. The thing that's ironic is that I promised myself that this year I'd be more prepared... <laughs> I'd have extensive notes. I wouldn't spend 20 minutes trying to think of someone's name. Well, let's pull the curtain back a little bit and let people know that we we put this particular episode together at the drop of a hat. Like, we had not planned to go for another week. That's right. And we thought, let's just do it. And we haven't got notes. Neither of us are planned. <laughs> and that's what this is. <laughs> this is, this is, it's the, uh, it's the, uh, the the stuff up show <laughs> we're just having it really early I love that that took you ten seconds to get out to get that work because in <laughs> in studio on studio sixty on the Sunset Strip that TV show Aaron Sorka TV show they had the disaster show that's what it's called when everything goes wrong all the props break down the lights fall from the ceiling the people get sick well no better show to have it than the first one of the year yeah welcome so we know, everybody particularly all you new listeners stick around because we are a little more professional than. <laughs> This is not at all. Oh, dearie me, but yes, um, goodmoviemonday.com is our website. As I said, social media, TikTok, you have lots of like nice little 30 second clips of you know interviews, our chats, all kinds of stuff. Uh, Malzy Begg is another member of the crew. She was supposed to be here on this episode, but she had things on and couldn't make it. Uh, so she's going to join us in a few weeks' time and she'll be here every month thereafter. So looking forward to all of it. It's going to be a good year. But before we throw to our first segment, which will be Jarrett with his PE class, I just I'm just curious to know what you've watched over the break. What movies on your list do I need to edit this part because there's like long <laughs> long what, two what minute I, gaps between answers I while you watch, think? Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can run through mine. They're the things I did note. <laughs> what did you? Well, you go for, you go first while I try and anyone think that things follows are. my Facebook knows a few of these. Uh, Slapshot one, two, and three. I went through all three of them because I got the, the Blu-ray with the three in it. All-time hockey coach. Oh my goodness, that first one is an absolute banger. And then it goes down the bad news bears path in the degenerate yeah. sequels. You know, number two is not bad. Stephen Baldwin, I think it is. But that's, I mean, the thing that's so ridiculous is that part two is a really, really late sequel. Yeah, like twenty-five and, years later, and then they do number three. Yeah. Yeah, straight after. <laughs> <laughs> like Major League, except Major League 2 was actually close well, to like, Major League it's 1. It's like now we've got um, Beetlejuice 2 coming in and already talking about number 3. Yeah. <laughs> and Ghostbusters, the number yeah, th- the, the That's right. Yeah. No, momentum, it's called. It's Momentum. Yeah. Uh, what the else did I watch? Mo. Got I watched, the big mo. I watched an Australian film from 1990 with Max von Sydow. I didn't know that he'd oh, made a is film his father? Here. Yeah, I yeah. didn't know he'd made a movie here. Were you on Broly? The Umbrella yeah, yeah. Streaming <laughs> Service? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was good. Yeah, that's that a great good. movie. It's very much apt pupil without the thriller aspect of it. All yeah. about sort of a, a, um, a Nazi war criminal living in Melbourne and the media discover his did, presence. Did I watch that? Did I watch that uh, clips from the, of the Nazi Hunter show that, that I think it's on Prime or something like that with you? No. There's a great stuff with a guy from Happiness whose name I can never remember. Oh, uh, um, the the the, is the pedophile. talk show. Oh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. No, 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 the other one that looks a bit like. Oh, Philip the Seymour guy Hoffman. from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. That's the cousin with the truck that does it. 
Yeah, I think. It's, yeah, <laughs> I don't know his name. I don't know what his name is. Yeah, but, but he's the he's the father of little Billy. Yeah, in happiness. In happiness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Duncan he's in, or Duncan something or he's in like the Good Wife and yes, all this sort great of great actor. But he <laughs> he plays this like he's like the whole the whole premise of Nazi hunters is they're hunting yeah. Nazis who have escaped, and he's like pretending to be this kind of Midwestern guy. He's got two kids and a wife and he's having a barbecue for his friends and uh, you know, this uh, guy from work, he invites this guy from work over and he br- brings his new kind of girlfriend over and she recognises him. She was like a child in the concentration camps and pings him and he just kind of like, you know, he's like, at first he's playing it off like, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about and she kind of insists. He's like, ah, fuck it. And he just pulls out this gun that he's had hidden under the barbecue <laughs> and kills his kids. What? His kids, his wife, he kills everyone. My goodness. There's this amazing sequence. Tell you what is amazing. There's a video I saw on TikTok last week of, you know, the Leaning Tower of Pisa and you get all those people that try to hold it up in photos. Yeah. Someone put like Nazi German music behind it and all these people with their hands raised. <laughs> <laughs> great, great video. Great gag. I watched two Paulie Shaw movies. I watched Paulie I, Shaw is Dead. I saw Paulie Shaw in the, sh- in the show notes, uh, in the uh, list, and I'm like... <laughs> Is that like the anniversary of In the Army Now or something like that? I think was in the. the yeah, you know, yeah. I was like, who outside of Glenn? Exactly. Is <laughs> exactly. Commemorating the. Uh, but he's kind I of. Mean, when, he's, when he's, clearly, Biodome is his best film. He's kind of back in a little way because he's just done that Richard Simmons short, which is a pitch for the feature. For the feature, yeah. Uh, so he's kind of back in momentum at the moment. But I watched Paulie Shore is Dead, the movie he directed. That's yeah. actually really fucking good. And it's got everybody you can imagine in Hollywood in that movie, like just doing it for free. But then I thought I, I'm on the I'm on the train now I'm on the Paulie Shaw train and he directed another one called Paulie Shaw Adopted which is out fucking rageous. He plays himself and he wants to get on the to because he want, he's always wanted to be a celebrity right. He's always wanted to be like high bigger than he is you know because yeah. he always feels like he's the forgotten I mean, actor from the nineties. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was okay. He was like he was as big or bigger than so, Adam Sandler. So the premise of this movie is. Hollywood actors are getting famous by adopting African children. So he goes to Africa to look for the blackest child he can. And it is all filmed, almost mockumentary. You can tell they rocked up to half of these places without permission. Only the actors that are actually in the narrative are in on it. And it's just outrageous. The questions he's asking about all these black kids. It like, sounds like Bowfinger. <laughs> how do you get away with this? But it, look, it's, it's poorly made, but it's compelling. It's poorly made. <laughs> That's the zinger of the year, and yeah. we're only episode one. <laughs> we're only episode one. <laughs> um, I did revisit the 2022 Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which you re- might remember I hated at the time, and I've come... Oh, with Jessica Biel? No, this is the one that was made oh, for Netflix. Oh, sorry. Oh, the, 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 the most recent one. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've come around to love it. I wouldn't go that full, far. I, I did, have. I, I like the... the I like the bus sequence. No, oh, the bus sequence is great. But I've come full circle. I've watched it, I think, four times now because it's one of these films, there's something about it I just want to like. Yeah. And I now think it's probably the strongest sequel outside of number two and three. Yeah, right. Yeah, good stuff. I, I mean, the, I do I do like the 3D one. I don't. It's pretty, I don't. It's pretty trashy. Yeah, look, I mean... Then enjoyable trashy. The one I've preferred the most up until recently was actually the beginning, which was like the prequel to the Jessica Biel one, which everyone hates. Right. I mean, I think the best one's part two. Uh, yeah, it's such a complicated franchise. Yeah. Well, the best one for me is part one, but part two is as good in a different way. Different, yeah, it's completely different kind different of caliber. Yep. Different kind of film. Uh, what else did I watch? The Philadelphia Experiment, one and two. Yeah, right. Been a long time. Felt like a paré movie. That's it's you know speaking of Philadelphia Experiment, it was on like the I have a Samsung TV and I've got the Samsung yep. channels, and I came in and it, it already been on for ten minutes, but the final countdown. Yep. And I was like, oh, this looks really good. Yeah. It's very si- kind of similar to Philadelphia Experiment. Sure is. Um, and I was like, oh, look, I will i won't watch <laughs> it. I'm sure. I remember seeing it. It used to be on Blu-ray everywhere, yeah, like yeah. really cheap. You could get it. And I'm sure I've got a copy of it somewhere or, <laughs> yeah. you know. And so I just kind of, I was like, but I, I watched like 10 minutes of it. And I was mm. like, hang on a second. Lloyd Kaufman is in this. Yeah, I was about to say Lloyd's yeah, in Lloyd, it. Lloyd's Lloyd. in it. And you're like, oh, it was... It was you know, because I only watched five minutes of it. So for him to actually have been in that five minutes. Mm-hmm. But then, of course, I turned it off, went to bed. And the next day I got up and I was like, oh, I feel like watching the rest of that movie. I'll... Yeah. yeah. No, don't have it. <laughs> Can't find it. <laughs> Horrible. Because it's a good movie. It looked great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, very, very... Was it 70s? Yeah, but that's the Philadelphia Experiment as well. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a film trapped in time, which I think both of those are good candidates for a good remake. If they remade it. Properly. properly. I mean, I I did actually release 
<laughs> a Philadelphia experiment, put it out on Blu-ray, got interviews with Michael Pare and Nancy Allen for it. Yeah. Uh, but didn't actually watch it at the time. <laughs> <laughs> didn't watch the... Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I have, I've seen Philadelphia experiment. I watched it as a kid and mm. a couple of times since then. But I didn't actually go and re-watch it when I had yeah, the yeah, Blu-ray yeah. to do. I was just like, oh... I'll tell you, a movie I did watch that... I was with you when I purchased this on Blu-ray. We went to my local JB and, and bought some things. The Mind of Mr. Soames. Which yes, is that Terrence Stamp this, yeah. movie. And look, it's kind of like in Cine Man before it's time. Like he's a, a coma patient that's been in a coma since birth. Right. So I think they wake him out of his coma at the age of 30. And so he's he's a human for the first time, but at the age of 30. So he has to go through all of the baby years and like you know but the, and I thought this is the a great development, but at least by, at that age he's not getting an, an erection every five minutes <laughs> you saved you saved, <laughs> you saved thought, that awkward uh, I'd never seen it I'd heard about it and I thought this is a great concept I'm really going to enjoy this movie because I love Terrence Stamp it annoyed the fuck out of me Ooh. he cries like a baby rocks back yeah. and forwards and I'm like this is like over the top do fucking you, hell do you remember when you were in high school and you would have to go and see like plays put on by senior citizens who would be like mm-hmm. who'd like you know, act as teenagers to tell you to not take drugs and stuff like that. And you're like, that's what I imagine yeah. it would be like when they're like, you know, like in that, that those sketches on 30 Rock where Steve Buscemi is playing like a high school kid. It's I like watch videos the... of senior citizens all the time and I always wonder, am I going to be that old person in a nursing home that gets the biggest thrill by like pushing a ping pong ball with a feather across the table? <laughs> like, have you seen the games they play? It is like being back in kindergarten. I just think you're happy every day that you don't shit yourself. <laughs> That's true. I mean, that applies now. It'd be like, uh, you know, the joys of constipation. I didn't shit myself today. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, so I'll, I watched a whole bunch of stuff. I uh, went to the cinemas and saw a few. We both saw Argyle. We'll talk about that a bit more when we have Matthew Vaughan on the show. Colour Purple, I saw that. I like oh, that. Oh, the new one? Yeah. yeah. Kind of like that. Bob Marley, One Love. I remember yep, saying I wasn't going to see that. Yeah. What I enjoyed about that one was it wasn't really a biopic. It was more of like a, an ethos. It captured a, a, a moment in time right. and a mood and an atmosphere. I, I, I feel like it would be very similar to that Bee Gees doco that was on uh, Netflix, <laughs> where, where there, which is all about the... I mean, it, it charted their whole career, but yeah. it really kind of focused on when they yeah. discovered the falsetto. And That's right. So this was all about period. his exile Yeah. Um, and, and that one album he created. So I appreciate that because I don't need a fucking you know i don't need to know what his childhood was like they do it in tiny flashbacks but it's mostly this yeah era drive away dolls which um you know we'll talk about when ethan is on the show but that was actually originally called drive away dykes which i talked to him about um and obviously they weren't allowed to use that to as use the title. The title, yeah. but they really do give the big middle finger to the studio in the movie about drive away dykes which is fun because it, I, i'm hoping that it's like a there's actually a giant dyke in the film <laughs> He's making hand gestures like a, a physical dyke. Like a physical dyke. <laughs> yes. Like the one in Holland. That That's the, right. The little boy puts his Yeah, he's in. not talking about like Amazon women. Like yeah, no. <laughs> like that big giant dyke. Attack of the 60 foot set of fold. <laughs> but um, I'm assuming you can't remember anything you've watched. No, look, I did. I, I Look, I watched a lot of the movies that I've been working on. So Them. Uh, I watched Them. I watched... Um, watched Them movies. Them movies. <laughs> the French, The French extreme <laughs> Them. Uh, Ills, otherwise known as Ills, mm-hmm. Ransom with Sean Connery, which is and Ian McShane, which formerly is great. the terrorists. Well, well the, kind the, of the Australian. It title. was the U. No, well, the US released it as the terrorists, but in the UK it was always Ransom. But then Umbrella originally released it here as a terrorist. They did it here as a terrorist. Yeah, yeah. Look, I honestly don't know why because I'm pretty sure on video it was released as Ransom. Yeah, and that is the British. Yep, the China Lion, mm-hmm. China Lion, British Lion films yep. released it as the terrorist, but. Um, Cool. Uh, what else did I? Uh, what else did I work on? In that in that kind of last period, um, the Hitcher, ah, yeah, which classic. Uh, classic, which we don't really need to talk about because we seem to talk about it quite yeah, a no, bit on the show. We can talk about part two. Uh, yeah, which I was <laughs> furious at Umbrella for not including. Including, oh, wouldn't that? That's a that's a reason right there to buy without to even buy, thinking. Yeah, I was like, Blind this is the right perfect there. way to to do this is to get Hitcher 2. Like, it continues on seamlessly. Mm. But, um, what else did I watch? I watched a lot of TV, I will be honest. Mm, yeah. I did watch a lot of TV. But that's, that's Ben downtime stuff, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really... Well, that uh, doesn't sound good. I watched, actually, I watched... Um, <laughs> ben downtime. Ben downtime. <laughs> ben Dover time. Uh, 50 cents, I bend over and touch my toes. A dollar, I bend over and touch your toes. 
Three dollars for a BJ, four dollars for a ZJ. What's a ZJ? You don't know. You can't afford it. Uh, I did watch um, Once Upon because I, I I read the the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood book. Yep. yep. So then I went back and rewatched the the film, which was uh, I think that gets enjoyable. better every time. It does definitely get better every time. Yep. And especially like the book adds a lot of context, and there are differences in the book from the sure. from the book to the film uh, that are quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also watched Office Space again, which I haven't oh seen in years. Oh my god, yes, so good. They're so infinitely good. quotable. Yeah, stapler. Yes, down. That's the last draw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the. Uh, I never really liked paying bills, so I think I'm going to pay them anymore either. You're a very bad man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Najim and Michael Bolton. I said it's you to five years hard labor in a federal pound me in the ass prison. So good. <laughs> ah. yeah, Michael Bolton, that's an interesting name. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was an interesting name until some ass clown started writing songs and winning Grammys. Such a good film. There's a spin off show for us. We should just like quote just, just movies. Quote movies. Yes. So yeah, so that's I, I did watch those. I'm sure there's uh, there's there'd be I did actually I watched um, Passport to Pimlico, which I'd never seen Ooh, before. Wow, no, the I studio film. I haven't seen that. Uh, I did. I remember. I've always known about the film. And I've wanted to see it for ages. It's only come out on Blu-ray overseas. It hasn't come out uh, locally through. Uh, it's a uh, Ealing studio, so it'd be all Studio Canal here. Uh, but while I was in the UK, I did see the subway stop for Pimlico, and I was like, oh. <laughs> I didn't bring my passport, so I just didn't bother stopping there. It's like it's when these like words that you've heard before, yeah. somewhere along the way, actually become reality. Yeah, it's like um, what is it Pals Keepy? Like, you know, yeah. so, there's a place called Pals Keepy. I just thought it was yeah. gibberish, gibberish. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And you like, and then you're there, and you're like, oh, that's that place, and that's uh, <laughs> you know. So um, yeah. So I, yeah, I, did, I watched a bit. I, I have a, I borrowed a whole stack of uh, of those uh, Ealing. Ealing comedies kind of thing. The one, the one that I really want to watch is Innocence in Paris, which I remember seeing Ivan play on TV mm. one afternoon, and it's all these. It's basically all these people from London going on holiday for the weekend in Paris, and there's like they're all you know, there's Margaret Rutherford and and her young niece are going to visit family, and mm-hmm. Lawrence Harvey's over there to. Um, is it, I can't remember if Lawrence Harvey. I think Lawrence Harvey actually plays a Frenchman, but there's a, you know a young girl goes and gets swept up in a romance, and Alistair Sim is going for it like a, you know they've all got different reasons, and they all kind of they meet on the train, then they have their experiences in in or on the boat or <laughs> whatever it is they're doing to get over the go across the channel, and then they all kind of meet back on the way back again. And then a teenager threw milk on them. Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> got got, ex- got expelled from school. Good on them. Good on them. Throw the Throw the the proverbial milk carton at that kid. Yo, what's up? This is Polly Shore, and we are in the streets of Africa. I am here to adopt a baby. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be gorgeous. I'm going to take it back to America with me for a better life. So I was thinking we'd go rock climbing. Go to the top, son. Get me down. The top is America. Holy shit. Here we are, Jarrett. Once again, happy new year. It might be March, but that's, you know... It's never too late to say Happy New Year. <laughs> hey, I'll oh, yeah. take a Happy New Year any day of the week. Uh, here we are for another year of PE class. I'm excited. What the hell's been going on with you? Did you have a good break? Uh, well, look, by break, <laughs> I did did have two weeks off from the uh, regular monster work, but I did see the opportunity of having time <laughs> off from monster to be able to do more work for other places. Uh, so I, I made the most of that and did a commentary and a couple video essays and yeah, I think that was that was sort of it. And I, I, I consumed, I bought more media than I could physically watch. Uh, <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'm going to have it all buried with me, though, so uh, I won't be leaving it to anyone. Make sure that's that. I'll clear your browser cache, Ben, but make sure they bury me with all my physical media. I'm not having <laughs> someone sell off these limited editions for a buck a piece. <laughs> I'll just come and just take the lot. Yeah, exactly. Out. That's right. This, yeah. If you if you are planning on uh, carking it, just let us know in advance so we can uh, <laughs> fill it. <in. laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So hey, I just before we jump into any kind of um, PE class stuff, I was wondering what your thoughts were on um, this whole Sony taking over the Disney stuff. 
Yeah, it's an interesting one as to whether it will touch us locally. It's sort of hard to say because now, obviously, all interactive distributions handling the Sony stuff locally. Uh, so it would kind of be a reach if if they were to be handling the Disney stuff via Sony. Yeah. I think it's an interesting move. And I'm look, I'm all for it because Sony is probably, at least in the US marketplace, they're probably one of the better distributors out there because they're still doing Blu-ray and 4K for their key releases. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, they're still going through their archives regularly. I know it's the 100th anniversary of Columbia Pictures this year, so we're going to see a lot more releases. But even prior to that, you were guaranteed of seeing at least maybe six to eight catalogue titles a year getting the 4K treatment. And Sony don't pull any punches. Mm. They actually go to an effort of doing a really great restoration, new Atmos tracks, they look phenomenal, sound phenomenal, and then on top of it, they've actually got new special feature content, and they generally collect all the archival stuff as well. So it's a real comprehensive package, so, not yeah. like Paramount <laughs> who are doing these editions, and it's you just got to wait until a review comes out before you buy it because you get like planes, trains, and automobiles, and it's been scrubbed so clean that everyone looks waxy. But then you get something like Footloose that comes out that people are saying, oh, no, they've done the DNR on it, but it's not. It was just a very soft focus kind of film and actually is very true and the grain is present in the film, but it's, it's hit and miss with Paramount. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I'm all for. So I love that they're doing the, the Disney. Reckon they'll dip into the old um, Fox archives? I'd say, I honestly think, yeah, the Fox archives, I think would be would be... I just don't think we're going to see the Touchstone Hollywood pictures, any of those subsidiaries, Disney stuff happen. But I think, yeah, very well, I think the Fox stuff for sure. Because there's, there's a, you know, God, between the, not only like Home Alone 2 that's been streaming in 4K for a couple of years now, but like, God, what I do to have like a 4K mm -hmm. The Fly happen. And plus, we need to see the Aliens films out now. We've got Aliens getting released in the US this month. And in the UK, but then, of course, you know, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection and I guess all the others have already come out in 4K and nobody really needs the other ones in 4K, really. <laughs> I don't even know if we really need Alien 3 and Resurrection. You yeah. know, yeah. I'll buy them. Of course yeah. I'll buy them. The Fox, stuff <laughs> is kind of, the Fox stuff is kind of interesting because they that's been handled by Park Circus for a while before before Disney bought them out. So yeah. yeah. Long stuff. But I actually yeah. don't know what... Um, what's going on with all that stuff if it's still available i haven't seen much in the way of like you know no, the they're not then fox yeah no of, of the fox classics did turner no, and hooch ever get a 4k no but it did get blu-ray but only in some territories it's like splash got a blu-ray release in australia and maybe two other places in europe not in the states about, now that um, thing goes for about 200 dollars a piece Flash two? Never. No. no. Did no. it make it made it to DVD, I'm pretty sure, but I don't I think don't it know. made it quite as far as Blu-ray. Kind of needs but yeah, to. it'll be interesting to sort of see what happens with that whole deal. I mean, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it might be the saving of that Disney catalogue. And also these Disney titles that are only been available through that Disney, you know, sort of club within the States, yeah. like Return mm. to, you know, yeah. Oz and uh, Mr. Boogity, I think, also had a, a Blu-ray release yeah, over your, there as well. Your favourite, wasn't your favourite one of them too? Um, Buzz Bucket. <laughs> Buzz Bucket, yeah, exactly. So all these titles, I mean, it'd be great if, if Sony were to do some of these as well. But, yeah, as to how it'll happen in the States, I don't know because it's a very different situation for physical outlets in the States. Obviously, Best Buy's pulled out, so yeah. they're not really stocking anything and the mass merchants aren't really. Everything's gone online. And some of those titles are like the titles, if you put them online, will they do the business that if you actually had it physically facing in a store and someone gets a burst of nostalgia and goes, oh, mind a copy of Return yeah. to Oz. But yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how it all sort of plays out. But um, it's exciting. You know, it's an exciting time. I mean, Geez, 2024 already, the titles that have been announced that are coming, it's just it's phenomenal. We're finally seeing the big James Cameron titles, but we're also seeing really obscure titles finally make their way to disc, like Little Darlings came out recently. And these are films that we never thought would actually get a release past VHS or even DVD. So, look, I think anything's possible at this <laughs> point in time. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's talk about your T-shirt. Yes, indeed. Well, you don't want to. You don't want me to tell you about what's coming out in home entertainment this week because I'd love to tell you that. <laughs> what it's all you DVD? Want to it's all DVD. Yeah, oh, it's all okay. DVD. So I don't know if that's worth talking about. Realistically, <laughs> here we are, and I'm saying it's an exciting time for home entertainment. Can you this run week, by we've... titles? 
Okay, we've got a Mel Gibson title coming out, Desperation, Desperation Road, Road yeah. action thriller, straight to DVD, well, DVD release only. Uh, we've got Space Pups, which is a sci-fi family film that no doubt Simon Mondo is probably the only grown adult that is interested in that title, but that's coming out on DVD. Are you looking at that one? You're looking, uh, hopefully well, you get to do an interview with the director. <laughs> <laughs> Patronising son of a bitch. All right, move on. <laughs> and then we've also got uh, Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch that's coming out through Eagle. And this is Bruce Stern and Dee Wallace getting a nice little paycheck for their, for their retirement Good old fund. Mr., Mr. Sharknado directing that one. Oh, is it really? Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because okay. he's already well, he's, moved, he's already he's done, moved on um, some big and better things, hasn't he? He's already done another Sundance film, so this is sort of like the part right. two of his sort of, um, I guess, potential trilogy. Okay, well that's great. All right, well there you go. Who would have thought that you know the Mockbuster Man would venture into the Western Territory? And, Interestingly, you know, though, about that because I thought the title like it's a bit it's very asylumish, like you know Butch Cassidy mm. and the Wild Bunch. But then I learned that Butch Cassidy's gang was the Wild Bunch. So, all right, okay, there you go. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, okay, yeah. well, yeah, that's that's all that's coming out this week. Excellent. Anything Moving else on. is definitely not worth mentioning. <laughs> uh, but I do want to tell you, though, there is some more catalogue titles that are coming in the near future. One that I will mention specifically is uh, The Departed. The Departed's yeah. coming out on 4K locally, coming out April 24th, which is pretty damn cool. It's only a single disc, and I haven't done research yet to work out whether the, all the special features will be on the 4K or not. But, I mean, it's the kind of title you could walk into any thrift store or cashies and pick up on Blu-ray or DVD for a buck. So if it doesn't, buy it there and then just, you know, put it in the case. Isn't that coming out same time as Goonies? Yeah, I think that's they're coming out about a week or two early. I think they're coming out maybe on the 10th right. of okay. April or so. Yeah, cool. yeah, the cool. 10th of April. But, yeah, they're finally, they're like Training Day and Goonies finally are coming out locally. This one at least isn't too far after the US release, which is nice. pretty good. But what about, have you seen a little film called um, Night Swim? <laughs> I haven't caught it yet. I missed the screening for it. Oh man, you missed nothing. You missed nothing. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> I mean, it, it was a stretch yeah. to begin with that premise. Yeah, haunted pool movie. But look, you know, I'm like, at least it's an original idea. Um, it's not an original film. It's, it sounds. It's, yeah. It sounds to me like an episode of Tales from the Crypt or something like that. It, 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 it would be perfect in yeah. a 30 minute capacity. Absolutely yeah. perfect. It, but it, yeah. That, that one's getting a release on DVD and Blu-ray. I don't think anyone's mourning a loss of that one not getting released on 4K. I certainly am not. Yeah, I was curious if anyone had seen it because seemingly no one has. Well, I was supposed to do a junket for that one and um, the junket uh, fell through, so I didn't bother with the film. Fair enough. It probably makes sense. They probably, someone had a look at the film and went, mm, do we really want people watching this and asking the director what his intentions were? Yeah, so thoughts yeah. on Creepy Crawlies? <laughs> well, it's actually based on, funnily enough, based on a short film, makes a lot of sense. And I mean, I, I did you see Baghead recently? Yeah, I did. You did, you interviewed the director as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Baghead was a great short. Yep, <laughs> correct. Just, just like Night Swim, I imagine that was a great short as well. But we don't have to make all these shorts into features, do we, lads? <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> so you mentioned the T-shirt that I I'm did. wearing. Right I now. did. Benjamin, so, we've got some up. news, don't we? We do. We do. That uh, would have uh, only dropped just, just, just before mm-hmm. this dropped. Yeah, mid last week. Mid last week. <laughs> just well, late, late just about week. five days prior or so. Yeah. <laughs> late last week, but you know, look, not everyone. Yeah. Uh, everyone. Uh, I think a lot of people out there just wait for Good Movie Monday to get all their their news. Precisely. They don't, they don't go on social media. They don't uh, follow us. They only follow us on TikTok. So. Uh, <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Well, they're certainly not following Monster Fest on TikTok, so no. <laughs> I can assure you of that. We do have a TikTok. We have no subscribers at this point in time. Don't worry, I'm going to rectify that. I'm going to put up some um, curiously erotic videos of myself. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you've just <laughs> added a, this copy of Toxic Zombies. You've just added a <laughs> massive workload to your, uh, to your schedule. Yeah, I certainly didn't want it. I was very <laughs> resistant to the to the TikTok. And plus, it means every time you open it, it doesn't go straight to your profile. It goes to the feed. And the feed's based on the things that obviously you said you kind of liked when you set it up. And, of course, I spend 20 minutes watching everything in that feed. And the feed also, is endless, no, 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 so I could the spend way, an hour the, there. As, as all algorithms do, the way TikTok really preys on you is if you last more than 20 to 30 seconds on a video, 
that's all you'll see for the next fucking hour, hour you know. Uh, so, explains it. Yeah, I've seen I, a lot of guinea pigs, dash yeah, that's hounds, right. pugs. I was going to say, the, the trick is, the trick is you've got to, when you're scrolling, you kind of got to try and keep two videos on the screen at the same time, like know what the next one is. So they can't <laughs> screw you on the... Yeah, I like that. The I like that. I know, I'm watching this one. I'm, so I'm still on this. I know <laughs> yeah. that the next video is this Fuck one. that algorithm. Yeah, so just <laughs> watch all of the Good Movie Monday TikTok videos all the way through, and that'll be your algorithm. Oh, perfect! It'll all it'll all sort itself out. You know, are you trying end. to are you trying to advertise it or turn people off it? <laughs> <laughs> Which one? <laughs> I don't think we have to do anything to goes hand in hand really. for the Monster Fest TikTok <laughs> at this point in time. <laughs> all right, weekend. Uh, so weekend, we're doing it again, uh, and as Ben and I had hoped, we are doing another entirely repertory program. So all classic films, all celebrating milestone anniversaries. Uh, and it was something we discussed after doing the 3D one last year, and it got such a great reaction. Yeah. People want to come out and see, you know, films they love, but they also want to come out and see films that they've never had the opportunity to see on the big screen. And we've got a few of those. We've got like, you know, um, I Madman, aka Hardcover, went straight oh, to yes. video in Australia, putting that up on the big screen first time on Australian cinema screens. I That's dare a, say it's going to be a first time for a lot of people to see the film, which is directed amazing. by your old mate, yeah, Tibor the director of The Gate. This was the second feature. This is the feature he did immediately after The Gate and unfortunately got caught up in a whole lot of studio, uh, well, listen to The Gate 2 commentary and you'll find out all <laughs> yeah. about it. But needless to say, it had a pretty sheltered release and then yeah. straight to video in Australia. So the fact that you are be able to see it on the big screen is pretty amazing. Then Deranged, as far as I can tell, Deranged never had a theatrical release in Australia. And I don't know if it ever actually came out on home video in Australia before it got released on DVD by like Shock yep. in the early 2000s and no. then later again. I always it remember didn't... it as a late night TV. Yeah, totally. It used to be like Channel 9, late on Channel yeah. 9, late and that, night. And that's that how I first saw me. it. That amazes me because I've told Ben this before, but like if anyone ever asked me what's the scariest scene in a movie, I go to Derange. And it's the scene when he chases yeah. woman out of the house with a face on him. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's, it's super terrifying. Un super unsettling. But, yeah, I remember trying to chase it for years yep. and then happening upon late night TV in the in the TV guide. And I'm like, can't be. Can't be. <laughs> and then sure enough, stayed up, set the tape, and, sh and it was. Like, and as far as I could tell, it, oh, it wasn't completely uncut because the version we're going to play is completely uncut because there's one scene that was yes. reinserted back maybe – Eight years ago, is that the brain so, and scene. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's in this this particular. Awesome. Version I mean, that, and, and deranged for people who don't know is inspired by the exploits of Ed Gain. Um, but so was Ta Ch Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and so these films were made the same year, but this one was completely overshadowed by Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, but and yeah, it's, it's more, just, yeah. more it's horrific. We, it's we definitely about, this. Uh, we talked about Home Alone before. <laughs> And Robert's Robert Blossom, Blossom, the star of Deranged, is yes. creepy next door neighbour yes. in Home Alone. Yes. You, I know, and the beautiful thing is I didn't see Deranged until after I'd seen Home Alone because I don't <laughs> think it had aired on Channel 9. So as soon as I revisited Home Alone, I'm like, oh, my God. I mean, oh. it's the Robert's Blossom. It's the name that makes you think. It's a great yeah. name, isn't it? You always think it's like every time Every time I've tried to type it out to put into the um, into the website and stuff, it auto-corrects it. I have to go back. <laughs> No, and delete Robert. the S. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's his name. His name is Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, that's exciting. But then one that Ben's pulled together rather amazingly, and it was his genius idea to do, is a marathon of sorts. Yeah, we're doing uh, uh, all three Angela films, the uh, Sleepaway Camp trilogy. The Holy Trilogy, we'll call Holy it, because we know there's yeah. Return to Sleepaway Camp and all these other ones that don't actually matter, the and they're not really canon. We're talking, we're talking yeah. Pamela Springsteen and Felicia Rose. We're talking that Sleepaway Amazing. Camp, that, that era, that uh, that gold. I just wonder if Ben will last the distance. <laughs> well, no, Ben, I didn't make never. it through June two, part two. <laughs> Why would I make it through? Uh... Was it long? <laughs> we both had a bit of a snore. Intermin interminably yeah. long. <laughs> oh, the first one was long, and I thought this one at least might cut to the chase and actually have a bit of Dude, action because he sat through the, the story chase. last time. Cut it to does, the chase. It, oh, fuck it does, it. What, what it seemingly does, and I'm not sure what the actual runtime was. Was it like 172, I think? So it's 172 yeah. minutes. It's 150 minutes of blah, 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 nothing happening, and then 
22 minutes of action and you're like, well, if you want to spread this out a bit during the rest of the film. Look, if he'd taken Dune 1 and Dune 2 and mashed them together, you'd have a nice two-hour film. Yeah, no, okay, David makes Lynch, sense. Like, you know, even though he took his name off it and had all his issues, that David Lynch version covers it's the main right. points and yep. just and gets the, to the meat of the story. Yep. And it's yep. got Colin like, McLaughlin as opposed to Timothy Charmelet. Well, look, Charmelet yeah. is good in this, particularly in the final mm. act. I think he really comes into his own with this one. I, I, and I do love when, when the action is on, I think it's really good. But he's okay. spent so much time in fucking windswept deserts, fucking clicking with tongues, trying to summon ah. fucking worms and shit. Yeah, I felt I felt yeah. that in the first one. Yeah. So that doesn't sound enticing. <laughs> I want to see it. Now, look, but I, I think I'll wait for home entertainment for this one, to be honest. I think I could comfortably watch this one in the living room on a 75-inch yeah. OLED in Atmos, and that's fine. But there's a very good chance I'll never watch it. Gentlemen. That said, I didn't Look, hate I, it, but you know, yeah. yeah. I'm really, I'm really interested to see because it does set up a lot of the stuff that happens in the future books. Yep. Because which oh, okay. is not at all um, really covered in the in Dennis. What's his name has said he's busy writing a third one. So he's oh, going to okay, do like, cool. Messiah mm-hmm. and Children of June, Messiah of June, and yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it does the whole thing. It turns into this big kind of religious war. Like he, ba- you know, he basically at the end of the film he becomes like the head of this kind of Fremen religious, you know, order, and it basically is him, like Catholicism, like spreading it across the universe, you know, by sword, by fire, and by sword. Right. So it, it could, you know, if it does all that stuff, maybe I still don't think it's going to be worth it. But I did say to Glenn after <laughs> we watched it, I said the best special effect in it was the de aging of uh, Gary Ulwis in it. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> Because I like that's that's Austin like a Butler. Name. Austin, Austin Butler. Butler when they shaved his head and shaved off his eyebrows looks he exactly looks exactly like a young Cary Ullis. Yep. Or wow. Ullis, whatever his yep. name. Is. Yep. yep. I kept waiting for him to say, uh, you know, um, was it as you wish or whatever it is. <laughs> 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 Well, we're not doing June two uh, part two of the <laughs> festival. I can assure you of that. So. You know, n- never fear. It doesn't fit within the slasher because that's the thing. I don't know if we mention it. It's all slasher it films. It slasher films. It's all slashes. Excellent. So we, you know, we're doing Nightmare on Elm Street, 1984. We're doing yes. Craven's New Nightmare. So we're doing both of the Craven, Freddy Krueger films. And meta both before have- Meta came along. Absolutely. The yeah. ultimate Meta movie. And it's funny to think two years later he would do Scream, which was like yeah. the first serious Meta horror movie because of course we had like student bodies and things like that you know uh slasher type movies yeah god that'd be a great festival ben slasher parody movies yeah like student bodies and the other ones that i can't think of oh, pandemonium YouTube um, there's a few up. others yeah that could be great i mean it might I be remember watching short marathon. Pandemonium. was it is it national lampoons is that what was the uh, yeah? I think the it National got Lampoon's class reunion or something like that, where there is oh, class, like a, no, no, that is class reunion, and that's a slasher parody too. Like yeah, slasher, yeah. yeah. I remember tuning yeah. in. That was another one that Channel Nine used to play late at night. Doesn't that have and Anne I, Ramsey? I was just sorry, Anne Ramsey in that could be. I would get could up be. and have a remember. look at the Blu-ray because it's there, but I am wearing <laughs> boxer shorts, so I don't want to reveal too much. And they are short, so <laughs> I, I remember watching. I used to only watch those late night oh. movies. For the chance to see TNA, I here it is. Short, short and uh, I remember tuning in on that one, going, "Oh, great! It's a it's a college kind of high school sex comedy." Next thing you know, people <laughs> are getting killed, and I'm like, what "Yes!" The fuck is this? Oh man, I love this. I used to rent the old roadshow video like all the time back in the day. It's John Hughes, yeah, right. It is. It's written by John Hughes, and it's yeah, it's got um, what's his name? It Garrett Graham. Yeah, I, I reckon Anne Ramsey's in it. I reckon it's got uh, that would make sense. It seems like it could totally be an Anne Ramsey film, but yeah, so we're not playing that. But <laughs> if you, you want to come around, maybe we can screen that one in the next garage year. one maybe, day. Next maybe year, next yeah, year. the maybe slasher next, parody maybe. one. And so there's other films. I think we've got we only maybe we haven't mentioned one film. We've, we've got Nightmare we mentioned on all Street. the other ones. Yeah, we mentioned Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, Friday the 13th. Yes. That's the one we haven't mentioned. Uh, the final chapter. Final chapter, 40th yeah. anniversary. Tom Savini returns to the special effects. Yes, Crispin Glover dancing like no one's we watching. Should do a, we should do a like free ticket to that screening if you can replicate his dance perfectly. And we <laughs> Absolutely. put it against the screen at the cinema and you've got to do it. 
That it's would like, be amazing. And the whole audience can clap at the same time. Dead yeah. fuck, dead fuck, dead fuck. <laughs> and it's, Did you like, see the press release for the, well, I, I don't know. I think it was in the press release, I'm pretty sure, but it's also on the website. When I described the film, I uh, mentioned that it's Corey Feldman's first, you know, lead role in a feature film, but I called him Corey Comeback Kid. Yeah, here, here he comes the comeback king. We should get that chant going on when the movie is on. I'd love that. But yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be amazing. It's three days, um, two films first night, three the second, and the marathon on the Sunday evening. So it's gonna yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Awesome! Everybody, jump onto your I think, you know, I think socials the, and check it out. The marathon, the marathon will be done by like nine nine o'clock. So you yeah, can it's a, it's, a, it's a mini marathon. It starts so at five and it'll be over. Yet. It's only twenty minutes longer than uh, what was it the fla- the Killers of the Flower, Flower, Moon. Flower Moon? That was yeah. one of my selling points <laughs> when Grant was like, "Oh, how are there going to be breaks between movies?" And I go, "Look, we could do a ten minute break between you know the movies, but realistically, people sat through the Killers of the Flower Moon and they were fine. So you know this this is much more bang for your buck. Everyone's going to be having a wild time. You know, just sneak out during a bit of the dialogue. Look, it's not June, so you're not going to be able to take a shit during the movie." But you could have a quick wee. The, the woman not next to me, the, the woman in like one seat over, I swear she was gone for 45 minutes, which I assume was taking a massive shit. <laughs> I don't know how any, everyone didn't miss her because she was wearing this like super bright kind of multicolored overalls. I was Jesus. like, that's, that's not the way you want to wear what you want to wear when you have to walk through. <laughs> You're that discreetly IMAX trying to get through a cinema. Was it yeah. IMAX as well? Yeah, it was IMAX, yeah, yeah, of course, and that's even worse because, like, yeah, oh, yeah. God. Ben, uh, Ben, unfortunately, rocked up a little bit late, therefore he had to squeeze his way to the center of IMAX. Oh, yeah, well, at I least te- he had I a seat held a lot for of I teabagged a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably the most exciting thing of the night for them as well. They go, Absolutely. movie was all right, but the pre-show was fantastic. They got to see it. I mean, that's like a 3D experience with that sandworm right in their face. <laughs> 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 all right, mate. Thank you. It's been great having Thanks, you back. Thanks, guys. See you next week. See you Bye. then. Stay physical. <laughs> oh, hang on. I've got notes for this. i got notes for this. i got a script. <laughs> That's the sound of Ben coming into his segment fresh. <laughs> How are we going there, sport? Good, 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 good. We're at that good, part good, of the show where it's your turn. Yeah, now, so earlier today, you you asked me if I'd prepped for this segment. <laughs> and uh, I t- completely blanked. I was like, what do you mean? What segment? <laughs> Uh, and you say, oh, you know, the one where you usually play like some game or, yeah. you know, trivia or whatever it it's is. It's the segment I don't have to do anything You for. don't have to do anything for, yeah. And uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, okay, that. <laughs> I don't have to do any prep. I don't do any prep it's for that. It's been three months. It's, it's a long time. Months. But yeah. then, but yeah, by, but, but actually by that stage, hmm. the, during the, the, the pauses in between that text conversation, a little germ of an idea kind Ooh. of... Uh, Kind of popped up. A uh, German idea. A German idea. Ah, oh. uh, and you know, so I've decided that. Uh, fuck it. You know, like, I think last year we kind of did. We did. I think I may have uh, <laughs> wheedled this in towards the end. Okay. But uh, I've decided that this segment from now on. Oh no! Is going to be. I'm nervous. Is going to be my unrealized podcast idea spinoff that will never happen because <laughs> oh, so I'm too this lazy. Is, this is in lieu of that. This is in lieu of that. <laughs> so this is going to be. This is going to. This is the terrific, t- terrific TV Tuesday podcast. <laughs> the only, the only Tuesday TV podcast that drops on a Monday. That's right, as part of a Monday podcast. Part, yeah. <laughs> We're going to be a day ahead. You've got a terrible case of the Mondays. And I actually did. I, I do have a. I do have a theme song, a little ident. Please. That will play now. It's Terrific TV Tuesday, the only Tuesday TV segment that drops on a Monday. <laughs> thought he was going to sing. I thought he was going to sing. sing. No, I, I can't remember. I got an AI thing to do it. <laughs> it's horrible, but it's going to be it's great. Fantastic. Uh, so uh, I just thought I just thought this would be basically like the like our recommendations at the end of the show, but we just talk about a TV show that we've been watching. And now, obviously, I didn't prep you at all. No. For this. <laughs> So this is great for me because this is how I feel 90% of the time on the show. How the tables have turned. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, Racking my brain. Uh, so I'm going to talk about. I just started watching this. I just recently resubscribed to Netflix. So I've been catching up on a lot of stuff. Yep. And uh, so this week, I actually started watching this TV show called Lockwood and Co. I've heard of it. Which is really, really great. It's based on a series of books by this guy, Jonathan Stroud, who I'd never heard of before. It's only one season. Netflix shit canned it, despite it seem, seemingly to have rated quite well, but they it didn't reach their threshold or something. But I think there's been a lot of complaints on the internet because the show was actually quite popular. And they're mm. like, these decisions for these kind of young adult, it's a young adult kind of show are made way too early. They don't actually let... Netflix actually don't give any of the shows on their platform time enough to actually yeah, yeah, yeah. build an audience. Yep. And that's been the kind of problem. But this show was uh, uh, adapted for TV by Joe Cornish, the man behind Attack the Block. And mm-hmm. uh, he's... I do know of him, yeah. Yeah, he's... Um, he co-wrote the last Tintin movie, wrote the Edgar, Edgar Wright's version of Ant-Man he wrote and... Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. So he's got, it's got a pretty good pedigree. I really love Attack the Block. I wasn't too sure I about the too. first time I watched it, but the, the second and third time, I fucking loved it. Yeah, that's how I feel about that. Um, the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> the, the one I lent you, the um, frequently asked questions about time travel. Yes. Very yeah. similar kind of thing. Yeah. Um, gets better with every viewing. Yeah. So, and the, the basic premise of this show is that it's kind of like it's a alternate alternate history version of the UK. Yeah. Where fifty years ago, uh, spirits, ghosts started mm-hmm. appearing. Usually, angry ghosts, and if they touch you, you go into a, like a, a coma. And they mainly come out at night. And because of this, basically, technology has ground to a halt. So there's no internet or anything like that. People are still, you know, everything's in books. People have tape cassette recorders and mm-hmm. you know stuff like that. Um, but the only people who can actually see or feel these ghosts until it's you know too late. Uh, kids, teenagers. So they actually, ha- all of these kind of invest, like these paranormal investigator groups are made up by teens who usually have an adult supervising them. Uh, but the main three characters in this film, Lockwood and Co, like they're three kids who have mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of stepped out on their own and are trying to make their own agency without the interference of adults who kind of, who basically treat the kids like they're um, tools. Yep. And... You know, they have pretty shit lives working for these kind of organizations. And it's just really, really good. There's like a, you know, there's a ghost head in a jar that talks to them sometimes. And like, it's, you know, people are getting killed and there's lots of blood and guts and, and stuff. It's I, really interesting I love show. the sound of it. I've seen the, the trailer. Um, yeah. But I'm, I haven't been curious enough to actually watch to actually it. But watch that it. sounds good. Look, it's a, it's a, you know, typical, it's a very, look, it's, it's a little bit longer than the typical British series because it's eight episodes, so yep. it's about the Netflix normal. Yeah, yeah, right. If it was a if it was a real British show, it would only be six episodes, but eight episodes, one and done. Excellent. Definitely worth checking out. All right. Well, I, I mean, I didn't have a lot of time to watch television because I got evicted from my house and had to find a new <laughs> one. Um, by the way, when I say evicted from my house, I actually like the the owner was selling up. It wasn't like we were bad tenants or anything like that. Uh, just in case people are wondering. But I did try a couple. So I tried the new um, True Detective, North oh, Country, season four or five. Yeah, it's it? the one that um, is it. Nicholas Vince was the original showrunner. I think he's left, and it's um. There's a woman who's taken over. Taken over and she's just got the Jodie nod Foster. For yeah, she's season, got, next that's season. right. I didn't like it. Like, I only got the one episode. So who's it? It's Jodie Foster and who's the other person? Oh, it's, a, it's, it's a younger woman that I'm not aware of, but she could be established. Yeah. Um, but I just didn't like it. I like the atmosphere of, um, like, North Country, being up in, like, the Alaskan tundra, you know, where there's no sunlight, you know, 30 days a night type of stuff. I, I quite, I love Alaska Daily, that, uh, <laughs> but that what, TV show. But what Hillary I didn't Swank. like about this, it started to sort of suggest supernatural elements. And, oh, and okay. like for True Detective, that's not what I'm after, right? So I stopped. So then I tried what everybody's going on about is Boy Swallows Universe, that new Aussie show. I did, I've seen that advertised so as well, yeah. The, the advertisement is incredible. Like that had me hook, line, sinker. Like I really wanted to watch it. I even had Chad from Boneheads in Kentucky tell me I've got to watch it because he's watching it. Um, once again, two episodes in, I just couldn't do it. Just didn't do it for me. So I'll probably return to it and persevere, but can't say I recommend. But what that did lead me to, because one of the 
the brothers, the older brother that doesn't talk in Boys Walls Universe, made another show that I did watch from 2023 called Crazy Fun Park. And it's a kid's show like made for the ABC, but it's directed by um, Nicholas Verso, who's like a horror director in Australia. He did like The Boys in the Trees and, and yep. things like that. But this is all about um, two teenage boys' best friends. One of them dies. And he dies in an amusement park, an old abandoned amusement park. And so when the when the alive friend still uh, goes to visit, you know, the death site just to sort of, you know, I guess, mourn or whatever, More, grieve, yeah. um, the friend comes out of the park with every other kid that's died in the park. So it's Ooh. this it's this theme park haunted Are by you sure teenagers. It's not, you sure it's not set at uh, at uh, <laughs> Movie World in the Gold Coast? <laughs> It's all the victims from the, the ghost train fire from, from the, the yeah. Luna Park. <laughs> no, so all these mysterious deaths over the years have happened and it's accumulated all these teenagers that live in the park. Fantastic show. It's very goosebumpsy, but it's Aussie. Uh, the production Ooh, value is amazing. Very uh, I'd never heard of this. I've got to check it out. Effectively spooky. But you've got to always bear in mind it's a kid's show. It's a kid's show. You know? And I love that, though. When they yeah. push kids' shows to that edge where it's almost too scary to be a kid's yeah. show, and the themes of like death and a little bit of suicide and Judith Loosely plays the um the strict teacher in it. Oh, she's great in it. I don't yeah, right. normally like her, but this is a role made for her. So yeah, that's the one that I really stuck to over the over the break that I had time for. Oh, lovely. There we go. So how how did that go? Your first episode of Terrific TV Tuesday. Uh, that was a. Uh, I think that went quite well. I'm looking forward to like there's like I said I, I have just signed up to Netflix again and like there's a. Uh, was it like there's a secret ninja fan? There's a hidden ninja family or whatever it is show <laughs> the, the that I'm. Pre- the premise of this whole segment slash show within a show is that I've got to search for a TV show every week now yeah. that I've watched. Because <laughs> I find that like I really have to now my attention span is such that for a, a lot of it, if we're not going to see a movie yep. at the cinema, like I really have to push myself to watch a <laughs> a film that's not brand new, like because I, I watch a lot for work and all that kind of stuff. And so in my downtime, I'm not watching that many films i just mm. it's like my my watch load has Fair. decreased especially in the heat because i do not do well in well the heat. you know where there's a will there's a way and you've been trying to shoehorn tv into the show for a long time <laughs> my friend and you completely I've, I've side done blind me but that's cool i'm looking forward to it um, what i might do for this is uh just talk about shows i loved in the yeah. past and you know there's no rules that's yeah. why i do that with movies too yeah. like if i haven't seen it in uh, I may have watched that movie last year, but yeah. that's the one I'm going to yeah. recommend. And you'll notice in this new office of mine, uh, or ours, it's our studio, the TV shows are back on display, my friend, which uh, I, was prepped, I was prepped for this segment. And the horror DVDs. Yes. The horror section is out from the garage and <laughs> here behind me. <laughs> that, was, that was two houses ago. That was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was two houses ago, wasn't it? <laughs>
Yes, I know, yes, I know, yes, I know now. We've got to talk about Avengement more. <laughs> well, now's the time. Yep. Now's the time, because this is where we're going to throw to my interview with Jesse V. Johnson. As I said at the start of the show, this is a guy I've actually had on my radar for a long time. I think I've dropped a few messages privately on Facebook and whatnot. Um, hasn't gotten through to him because, you know, quite often it goes to your junk folder and that kind of stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, if, if you're not actually in someone's network. But lo and behold, right now he's got a film out called Bodica, or Bodica, Queen of War. Bodica. They yes. What is this? Uh, well, Bodicea. It's, it's, uh, well, his daughter's name is um, Bodica, so <laughs> he's been obsessed with this story for his whole life, right. um, as you're about to hear in this interview. So no better opportunity than to chat with him, but let's talk about his movies. So before we get to the one we want to chat about, Pit Fighter, that's where he got, got his start. Yep. Accident Man, a Debt Collector, Triple Threat, Hell Hath No Fury, all Scott Atkinson movies. Like These two work together very nicely. They've all got... Fantastic names. Yes, and of course, Avengement. Does does uh does uh, uh yeah I can't remember his name. <laughs> the Muff guy. Walson Croft. Yeah, does he know that uh, he's uh, stolen uh, his name with a debt collector? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's two debt collectors in this series, but the funny thing is, the first one's called the Debt Collector. Part two is Debt Collector Two. Yeah, yeah. They, they dropped the the. But um, <laughs> it's like the Fast and Furious. No, yeah. no, it's not. No, yeah. it's it's Fast and Furious. It wasn't the first one, Fast yeah. and Furious. Never no, had that in it. Yeah, and fuck you if you're collecting. Yeah. Like, no, we don't care if these don't align. <laughs> uh, but look, I, I do love this guy as a director. I think he's got a real eye for action, and a lot of the DTV action directors do. Like um, Isaac Florentine. You know, these are the directors I think that actually have their finger on the action pulse. Yeah, that a lot of Hollywood ones don't. And yes, the uh, Avengement was. I think I think um, Agnes's best film. Look, I. I mean, he's pretty good in Ip Man 4. Oh, and Ninja. And, uh, and yeah, and he's good in... Um, John Wick. John Wick, where he plays the yeah. fat guy. He's <laughs> great. He's, he's great yeah. as the fat guy in John Wick. <laughs> but in a, that, just for, primarily just for that scene in the pub, yeah. where that little guy from This Is England or whatever it is, is like mouthing off about... Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's just yeah. like, it was, and he just calls him out as for being full of shit. It is such a fucking brutal movie. Yeah. I remember we watched it and we were surprised on how far they took the violence. Yeah. It's like the whole movie was that scene from Kingsman with the brawl in the church. Yeah. It's like, but this is like the whole movie. It's the whole movie. Yes. Yeah, so I do it's love good. this guy. But what I found fascinating was he has a, a stuntman background. So he was a stuntman long before being a director. Still is a stuntman, but worked with the biggest guys in Hollywood. He's worked with Spielberg a few times. He's worked with James Cameron on Avatar. What did he do for Spielberg? Like, he did War of the Worlds. He yeah, was, right. um, I think, one of the guys in the water getting... Where, you know, oh, yanked out. Up. Yeah, right. Um, which we talk about in this. I couldn't have this conversation with him without picking his brain on those, and he was yeah. happy to go down there. He does. He tells a great story about his time on um, Mars Attacks. Yeah, right. So this is an interview you want to want to listen to because once we do clear the the Bodica stuff, which is actually fascinating in and of itself, his Hollywood stories are pretty good. Now, could he? Did he back up your <laughs> assertion about Piers Brosnan? <laughs> no, just we can't say what that is. <laughs> no. He didn't. didn't. I didn't. didn't I didn't, didn't touch upon him, yeah. that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so here it is. Anyway, uh, Jesse V. Johnson. Enjoy, and uh, the video of this will be also online this week, which um, you can see his reactions to my questions. Sweet. Um, well, I mean, needless to say, like I appreciate your time. It's um, great to be chatting. I'm a fan of yours and have been for quite a while. So when I see your your name come up on 
on uh, films, I get excited. So this is a thrill for me. Fantastic. Thank you, Glenn. Really appreciate that. Um, and, and as a fan, like I can recognise that this particular film is quite a departure from a lot of the stuff that you've done. Um, is this a genre you've always wanted to explore? Uh, don't often think about it in terms of genre, but but it, but it ended up being uh something that i really enjoyed i hadn't really thought about as it was more about the characters and the story and you see mm. where those are supposed to being driven by a genre uh although i would have to say it's sort of quite fun to immerse yourself in historical pieces i do like that i did a world war ii film uh called hell hath no fury and when you make a film like that and you're writing it and directing it and basically producing it you you have to immerse yourself in that you every sentence every sort of action you know because you're, you're, not everything's written when you're making it you know there's things going on in the background there's elements you know the way a person moves or the slang that they use and you just have to be conscious of everything at every stage and i like that it's an immersion and the actors enjoy that and it gives you that chance to really sort of dig a little bit deeper so i i knew that i liked period pieces i'd gone back to world war ii that that was sort of a, a little simpler than going back two thousand years that well, yeah, uh, the, the Hell Hath No Fury was a little more contained as well. Like, I really liked that one, and I interviewed Lewis Mandalore for that one. Um, yeah, so I, I do think this, like, for, for what I know of your work, I feel like you've really gone all out with this one. It's big, it's sprawling. Like, I really uh, did. I put, it, I put everything on, I left everything on the field on this one, as they say. It was, uh, <laughs> it was a tough one. Uh, but but it was, uh, you know, it was a passion project that it consumed me for quite some time my daughter's middle name is is Boudicca and she's 17 now wow, so, amazing so it gives you a little hint uh the biggest problem writing the script is obviously you know the 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 reason for the revenge in the first place and trying to get my head around that I think that if I'm perfectly honest with myself that was what took so long getting this done it was how do you deal with something so atrocious and such an atrocity such a uh uh, sort of a crime against mankind what what do you do with that scene to make it cinematic and my experience with watching various other people try and make the film in low budget films or, or theater is is you know trying to confront that head on it's just not something you want to see it's too it's too too much and so mm. the the film just stated and it sort of hung in the back of my head for a decade or two uh until i sort of came up with that you know the the manner in which we handle the the children, you know, the, the two daughters in the movie. And when that sort of solidified, it became, you know, much more apparent that this was a film that I could make, you know, that was mm -hmm. going to work. And yeah, then meeting sure. Olga, Olga Kurilenko on White Elephant, a little film I did in Tifton, Georgia. And I got on very well with her. She was someone that, that really sort of uh, comes to the set with the same reasoning that I do, which is to make the best film possible. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's do what it takes and make make the film work. And I like I like collaborators like that, like Lewis as well, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I knew that with her and Boudicca together, you know, the script that I had, I knew I had something that I could work with. It was, it was, it was a hard time trying to raise financing, but, you know, it always cool. is. Being a passion project, as you said, and that you wrote it, is this a, a moment in history that you were fairly well versed in or did you have to do a hell of a lot of research going into it? Uh, I read a lot of books on that period. I, I Just just a lot of books. And then you'd put one down and you'd find another one online that someone else in some fan group recommended. I'd order that one and read that one. And, you know, there are only really, you know, really two, uh, two actual sort of, people that saw her or really you know one of them didn't really see her but Tacitus and Cassius Deo and they were the two Romans that, that wrote about her and so you know the, the the Celts didn't really record anything so as long as you're versed in the history of the time it's you have quite a lot of room for freedom you know you have to color within the lines so to speak mm -hmm. but everything else is it's very vague it's lost to the mists of time you know uh you know everything we know about the Celts was written down by the Romans there was no formal writing that they had so it, it had a little more freedom than, than the World War II film in that respect but the Romans had to be correct and you know yeah. the arm had to be correct and the, the way that they worked with themselves and we had a lot of I had a lot, a lot of help from uh, uh, historical advisors and you know sort of experts uh, one gal from LA we actually took to England she was there every day with us just double checking you know so mm -hmm. it's 
important and but but that side of it is fun you know it's the fun it's an exciting thing to do as you're working you know well it shows on the screen too because it feels like there's a bit of authenticity going on here but um you mentioned that you initially approached it with just with the characters rather than the genre but i'm wondering like given the films that you've made is there a fundamental difference between stuff like you know debt collector or accident man and then this like is there a big fundamental difference in how you direct no not really not really uh it's you know when I made Accident Man, I was trying to make the very very best low budget action movie with martial arts based on a comic book <laughs> that I could, and, and you know to that end, I worked very very hard on the script. Uh, you know, that came from from Stu and Scott. Uh, I, I worked very hard with the actors to try and make them as authentic as possible. And you know, it's it, you, you. I try to bring everything to every film. You don't want to have them. You don't want to have a film floating out there that you didn't really try hard on because. That'll be the one that keeps popping up, and you know that that you know just just because of the way things are, that's the one that everyone sees and talks about. And you're like, no, that's not a good. So you just you always you always try and put everything to it. I think with something like Boudicca, there was something a little strange happened on the set that I've never had happen before, which was, you know, we shot at a friend of mine. I'll, I'll get through this quick. I don't want to make a big deal of it. We we shot at a friend of mine's farm, and as it, as it turned out in the end, all the other locations were too expensive, and you know, mm -hmm. it ended up old school friend in you know Ipswich and as we spoke we realized that he was actually only 20 miles from Colchester which was the first city that she burned it was called Culloden and it was where uh the, you know the, the the temple of Claudius was that was the first sort of major murdering point of Romans that she you know so that was 20 miles away from this this wooded area and he came to me on the second or third day are filming there with a big wooden box and said, these are all the things, by the way, we've dug up since we've been here. And they're all like little Roman artifacts, little glass bottles and sort of little, little lead soldiers and things. Uh, so it was, it, it felt like we were very much where she had galloped around and lived to yeah. you know, almost two thousand years ago. And when you have that, it's a strange feeling that I've never quite had before. It was a burden of responsibility, like a, like someone, you know, don't, don't screw this up. She's, she's watching. She could be. Yeah. Yeah. Flat. That was a little different, and uh, you know, I, I certainly didn't have anything like that with with Accident Man or the earlier ones. But still, you you create your own, you know, your own sort of, uh, you know, your own worst, you know, critic and disciplinarian. Yeah. You have to be because you know these films are quite difficult to make and they're quite difficult to get financed. You never know if it's going to be your last one or not. So you really, really want to put everything you can into it. Yeah, I don't, but. You know, it's it's an interesting question. Did it feel different directing this, or was I different? I don't I don't think so. Uh, obviously, you know, those films are about you know the earlier films. It's certainly you're trying to come up with the most original and innovative way to show martial art sequences. You know, a certain amount of martial art sequences, and you're trying to come up with reasons for why those fights need to be there mm -hmm. that are organic to the story, and you know don't, that you know, and doesn't look like oh, it's a tournament, or you killed, <laughs> you killed my daughter, or kidnapped my wife, or whatever, and I've got to come after you. It's you know, it, you when you're doing the martial arts movies, you're always trying to come up with a different way to skin the cat, mm -hmm. but ultimately, it's about giving the audience those those fight scenes, uh, and that that is that's your mandate when you're making a martial arts film you know uh so there is that that's different with this one i didn't have you know i didn't have to do any high kicks or anything but we had, yeah. we had a lot of it, but it was you know a little more organic to it all but as i say when you're doing even when you're doing the martial arts films when i did those i tried to always make it as organic as possible and come mm. up with the most even if it was a 1954 french foreign legion camp in the <laughs> You're still trying to figure out the most original way to have two actors kick each other in the head. Well, yeah, I guess you can sort of um, you can swap out those high kicks and replace it with sort of the brutality and the violence and the gore because Maybe. there's lots of it in the film, but it does all feel very contextual. Um, yeah. So I was thinking, like you, you mentioned that there's you know a lot of responsibility and things on the line making this film. Do you have a moment, and this applies to all the productions, where you you just shit yourself and think, uh oh, what have I got myself into? Uh, always the night before the first day of filming, never sleep. Yeah. yeah. Do not. Sleep. It's uh, you know, you you're turning every single situation the following day on its head, working out what can go wrong, imagining it absolutely going wrong. You know, it's it's raining, pouring. You know, you're outside, and so you're not going to be able to film at all. And you're all going to be standing around. I used to have a recurring nightmare that I you know I came to set 
And for some reason, there was no one else there. And I was trying to move the camera as well as turning on the sound machine and then running over there and trying to do the clapper. And, you know, it was because it, for some reason, everyone else had just decided not to turn up that day. And, and, and that for the beginning half of my career was this recurring nightmare of, <laughs> of you know, of, of the worst case scenario. But uh, as you get a little more experienced, you look in the mirror the night before and you see someone who looks 10 years older than you actually are. And you go, it's OK, don't panic. You do this every movie. You get panicky every movie. It's <laughs> yeah. gonna be all right. In actual fact, if you weren't panicking, you, you I, then I'd be genuinely, profoundly worried. That <laughs> use that time of not being able to sleep that first night, turning over those situations, and yeah. invariably it, it's helpful because you know director should, you know, should be prepared and he should be there earlier or she should be there earlier than the rest of the crew and just get a feel for the set and see if anything, you know looks better than you'd expected it to or any problems that may occur. So it's okay to have that, that panic. And you sleep the second night really, really well. <laughs> See, years ago, I, I went to film school years ago and I wish that's the kind of advice they'd given us. <laughs> you know, right. the, embrace right. the panic, like, you know, use it, yeah. channel it. Well, you, um, you have to, I think that, I think for life, you know, uh, I don't know about other jobs because I really haven't done many other jobs. Mm. I think in life for me, embracing the panic is, is, is what it's about is is realizing you're terrified you're doing something here that isn't a job that people do there is no mm -hmm. uh, there is no plan on paper there is no blueprint that tells you how to do this you're literally figuring that out and you're going to go out there and you either panic about that or you sort of embrace it and go this is really cool this is like yeah. an event this is you know let's see what happens i'll do my do my best i'll have a plan a b c and d you know eventualities and let's see let's see what what happens try and keep people safe obviously mm -hmm. uh, and you go out there you know yeah i would better under pressure like that. yeah it was really like that on on this one uh it, it was it, it was an extraordinarily challenging shoot uh, mm. and i'm very very proud of what we ended up with the, the, the film uh, you know has scope that i didn't expect it would I, I thought we'd only be able to have three or four people in a in a hut and it would sort of be played out almost like a theatrical play and it got bigger and bigger as we went along and I'm looking around going, this is, this is okay. This is quite fun. So I, I truly hope people see it for what it is, which is, you know, a, a small story told, told, mm. you know, by a group of people who are very passionate, you know, and. Well, I think you've, you've also given us something that I certainly haven't really seen in these sorts of films. And that is sort of the home life of characters, like particularly in the first act, you know, is there a reason that you chose to focus on that domestic side? You see a family well, sitting down for dinner at the table, neighbours coming over, that kind of stuff we can recognise in our lives, but you never see that in these films. I'm so glad you've spotted that and you like that. That for me was what was, you know, the, the crux of the story. It says she's a housewife, she's a mm. mother, yep. she has two kids, she's proud of, she works hard to sort of bring them up and do what she's doing right. She trusts in her husband to keep her safe and life is pretty darn good for her. She gets her fingernails done and her makeup done and her hair done with the kids, just as, just as many affluent upper class, you know, or middle class women do. And, and even though it's 2000 years ago, uh, what is uncanny about the Roman empire is how similar in many, many regards it is to now the way they ate, celebrated, uh, enjoyed life, laughed, joked, uh, made love it's all it's it's very very similar you know mm -hmm. in many respects fashionably you know even the clothes and the and the, and the kind of jewelry and 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 where the makeup came from and how special that was and perfume you know if you wanted to pursue that you could wear those things nowadays and people really wouldn't turn a blind eye because you would actually look like you probably fit in more maybe more la or or mm. london than, than the high street in in the south of england but <laughs> but certainly uh, it's uncanny how very similar it is uh and 2000 years is is almost an incomprehensible amount of time when you think of you know families and what else was going on in the world so i i found that extraordinarily interesting and then the film comes to this devastating sort of gear shift mm -hmm. and, and and advances from there with a very different character and when i sold the script to olga uh i flew to paris to to pitch it to her at a hotel and and i i painted the two pictures of her the first is as you know with the ringlets and the beautiful hair and makeup and silk on and then the second with the eyebrow shaved off and the bad teeth and the split in the scar and the hair wild and that was that was part of my sale is look this is you get to play this mm. woman who goes 
through this incredible transformation, you know, uh, not only not only physically and, and, and the way that she looks, but internally and in her whole emotions and the way she is and acts. And we see we see this 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 change. And so that for me was what was exciting about the film, you know. Uh, it, you know, maybe it got lost a little there in the big clinking swords and Romans. <laughs> but, uh, but for me, that was what this movie was about. And that's what I was, you know, what was exciting and yeah. sort of uh, compelling. So I lent into this this whole uh, building her home life at the beginning. And maybe I made a mistake of that. Some of the action fans are, oh, the first half's really boring, you know. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what struck me and what I and- really got sucked in with. Good, good, good. Uh, it's it's you know you can't please everyone. You you when especially with a historical piece, you have people saying, "Well, she's why did you get you know, a Ukrainian to play an uh, someone who's so English?" It's like there was no, not only was there no England or English, there was no English language. You know that there, there was multiple languages spoke by these Celts. Not mm. one of them sounded like English. Uh, probably more like Ukrainian than English or Germanic or you know. Uh, none of them were were banded together what was so interesting about Boudicca was it was the first time that they did band together uh and from that came the English language and this wonderful you know empire country that you know has caused so much trouble in the ensue of 2000 <laughs> but uh but but for me that was the fascinating part of it but you can never please everyone you know everyone it becomes a, you know a fully yeah. a fully fledged reviewer with with knowledge <laughs> My, my favorites were the ones on on hell hath no fury that were saying things were out of place historically but you have no recourse of course if they're answering you online but yeah. it's like point anything from a, from from the cartridges to the cigarettes to the food eaten that was out of line uh well what do we say fuck them <laughs> the, same, the same thing went on on this one we worked so extraordinarily hard and still in some of the bigger mainstream press i'm reading and it's like this is not historically accurate which part point point to which part isn't but it doesn't matter. It, you yeah. know, the truth of the matter is if they're thinking that, then they've not fully immersed themselves in the film and you failed from that front. So I, I take it as a loss, but it's all right. I'm very proud of what, what we made. Oh, well, like I said, I've, I've loved your work for years and a couple of mates of, and myself, uh, we always look forward to seeing what comes next. But uh, you're a movie fan. I can see, look, in the background there, you've got these posters. So I'm wondering, were there any films that inspired you or that you leaned on for inspiration you know, making this film? uh yes lots lots and lots uh i wanted to go back further i try not to look at you know the more recent stuff like gladiator although obviously yep. everyone point to that one because you know lost family and revenge and all that kind of stuff although this story came a long long time before gladiator <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you know fall of the roman empire the anthony mann picture pictures like that i found very very interesting that were gritty uh and and then you know the way that the woods were shot. We wanted two very distinct looks to the film. It's very green, very lush and lively for the first half. And the second half, all the colours sucked out, the green and the warms are sucked out. And so we looked at various different films that inspired us uh, Mm -hmm. colour-wise on the picture. But there's a film by John Borman, the same director who directed this film, who's one of my absolute favourites, called Excalibur, which I love. The way that they shot the woods in that, where it felt like an organic being, uh, and I know it's extraordinarily difficult. They shot in Ireland, and I, I scouted North Wales for this one, which is a similar climate. You can't shoot; it's not, you get four hours of light a day, and it's raining on you know two days a week in midsummer. Uh, I would have loved to have shot in Wales, by the way. It, it, it was magical, and it had a lot of that sort of you know what you need for a film, but it would have been just impossible, you know, in the yeah. time we had. Uh, but he shot that in Ireland to his credit. A friend of mine, Bronco McLaughlin, was one of the stuntmen on it, and apparently it was just a brutal shoot. But there's something about the way they shot the greens and, and the metallic uh, chrome shiny colours against that green. They, they actually used green lights in the forest. And if you carefully, you can see the rocks are lit green. It's mm-hmm. not just, they've got a lot of lichen and moss as well. But but he used a lot of tricks like that. And that, that Jonathan Hall, my DP, and I tried to sort of utilise and, uh, and, and borrow from or be inspired by whatever the correct term is for <laughs> <laughs> So we yeah. like that one. I also like the in you know the the way that he handled the characters in that as well. You know, you've got a period piece, but they're not bloody well all sounding like Shakespearean actors, which no one would have done. Yeah. You know, they're tougher and they're rougher and they're they're more bawdy and they're more you know ruder and uncouth and se- sexualized. And this is how people have speaking for millennia. They, 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 you know, the posh English schoolboy yeah. is something that's come in the last you know less than a thousand years it, before that it was a you know rough and tumble 
you know, Darwinian existence out there, you know, and I wanted a little bit more of that in there that I liked. Uh, I, I, you know, I love English, you know, period pieces, but they, people are too wanton to put these very skinny, a fake mm. you know, Shakespearean actors into them that, that just, you just look at them, you know, they wouldn't have survived back then. <laughs> you know? yeah. like, unless they were particularly manipulative, and, you know, and, and coercive and sort of, you know, they were able to talk their way out of trouble and that's a different kind of character altogether. But most of them would have been knocked out with one punch, and I don't believe that they could have they could have operated in, in the position that they're supposed to be operating in in the movie. So yeah. I want guys in this to feel a little more meaty, uh, a little more. And I think that turned off people like the, the English Guardian newspaper. You know, the, the, they wanted a lot more more of the Shakespearean angle in it, and mm -hmm. it just you know me it just smells fake. I've been around guys, soldiers. I've spent my life around soldiers and stuntmen and yeah. Rulers and 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 farmers and you know people who work you know in the field and outdoors, and they they are a certain way you know they mm -hmm. you know they don't say things like they do in the national theatre. Yeah, hundred uh, <laughs> percent. You know, and I want these guys to be like that. I thought Leo Gregory was fabulous as a as a you know a Celt soldier with you know a, a very early form of post traumatic stress disorder and. Mm -hmm led him to be problematic. I thought Clive Standen was absolutely wonderful. And Peter Franz and I, the, the, you know, they brought a lot of that Viking sort of feeling to this, which, which you know, did a lot of the legwork for me. You know, they knew where they were going with these characters, uh, which was which was great fun to watch. Uh, fabulous chemistry with Olga as well. Um, mm. And Olga, uh, I thought, handled the, the, you know, the sort of move from housewife to warrior really well as well. Surprised, surprised me a lot. We tried to do it in chronological order. So we tried to shoot the housewife yeah. first. Because yeah. it would be a massive, not only a massive sort of emotional brain gear shift for it to go one way or the other, but it was a, a, like an hour and a half, two hours make up each time to put all this, yeah, this stuff. Right. Uh, but it helped to sort of do that in, you know, in, in almost chronological order, which which is something you don't often get to do. We we planned that sure. quite well. So that was fun. Awesome. Um, Before I wrap it up, I've got three random tangent questions for you uh, that I'm dying to ask you, uh, if you don't mind. Just firstly, just generally, um, what kind of movies do you gravitate towards when you're in your downtime? I'm looking behind you and I can see that you're sort of a, a man of the classics. Well, yeah, this one's Point Blank and mm -hmm. then that one over there is, they're both originals, that's uh, Good, the Bad and the Ugly which is, you know, I, I made a decision fairly early on, I'd only have posters of movies that I truly loved to inspire me, to keep me in the pants. I've got Red River down there by Howard Hawks and then... Yeah, awesome. Uh, uh, she wore a yellow ribbon I have as well you know the Ford pictures uh, I, I, it's criminal but it's by a pragmatic choice I try not to watch too much that is too recent and too popular mm -hmm. uh, and because it's good it's great stuff and, and I have a producer partner who watches it I have daughters and, and mm -hmm. you know and all these people watch it the problem is I, I'm like a sponge. And if I see this stuff, you know, I, I, it'll, you know, if I watch three Matrix movies, it'll start to find its way into my work. Gotcha. And you yeah. be very careful of that. I have a huge movie collection. And so I try to live, I end up living probably somewhere around 1960s, 70s, 50s, somewhere in there, movies of Bud Boddicker and Ford and, and Hawks and Raoul Walsh. And then, you know, uh, it's it's fantastic. And then action films from the 70s, you know, Don Siegel and, you know, and, and sort of early Michael Mann stuff and it, this stuff I just it's it's wonderful and it's great and it keeps me inspired uh you n you're never short of incredible sort of uh motivations and inspirations and it doesn't turn up in your film and make the film look like just another sort of you know uh, rip off of a, of, a, of the of the latest popular movie uh you know when John Wick came out which is a genius movie and mm -hmm. I know the guys and they're fantastic and I came yeah. up through with with them they were a little ahead of me I'm a little younger, but the, the the film is so good that it's sort of knock on effect spread out to everything, you know, uh, and, and it's very difficult to do that kind of hand to hand combat inside a house with a gun without going, oh, we need to do it now with the elbow and hit him with the stock just like they did on, you know, and that that's not what you want in a movie, you want to feel fresh and different. Uh, there's someone else. I, I I saw I heard two people talking about a movie they were prepping. They said, "Oh yeah, it's, it's Taylor Sheridan style." There's a couple of scenes in it will be really Taylor Sheridan style. <laughs> so, oh my god! And I suddenly realised that he's done so much work that's floating into the if you know the uh, yeah 
at the moment, the creative ether, that it's actually turning up. So that sudden violence, unexpected on the prairie, you know, you've got to be very, very careful. I mean, obviously he's copying, you know, he's being inspired by Cormac McCarthy, who's in turn yeah. being inspired by another writer. But but still, it's a, I try and avoid anything too fresh in the... Yeah, in the I mean, because then it goes from like being just like, basic homage to rip off like so you're you're sticking to the homage. yeah <laughs> you don't want rip off you don't want you know you just don't want the audience to to see behind the curtain too much you yeah know? 100%. Uh, you know, where possible i base it on books and people i know and and you know getting guys from special forces getting guys who've, who've committed some crimes and listen mm -hmm. to their turn of phrase and anecdotes that stuff's great that stuff's wonderful i did avengement was absolutely 100 based on me driving Luke Massey to work on Thor, you know, who was a you know, London, yeah. South London gangster for a while. And so it was his stories every morning that I wrote down. I said, I'm gonna put this together in a script. You cool with that? He said, yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> awesome. And that became Avengement, you know. Uh, yeah. and so there's not one single, single scene in that movie that's based on another movie, which which <laughs> yeah. was an interesting, interesting experience. And i if if possible, I'll try and do that. We did that with Boudicca. Mm -hmm. Boudicca was based on literary. Uh, information and work by Tacitus, who lived 50 years after Boudicca and wrote about her, and then Cassius Deo, who uh, I think was around at the same time as her and actually may have even seen her gallop and said he saw her galloping and yelling at the troops with her wild hair and how, how terrifying a figure he would have been. It's a little difficult to believe because he would have been quite a long way away at that time. <laughs> <laughs> But the Romans didn't, you know, they take his word for it. <laughs> a little bit, exactly. Uh, but we still have that. That was that's the main source of, you know, that was my main source of, of mm. you know, we went back from that, from those two guys' writings, you know. So that and that's sort of exciting to do, you know. Uh, but you've got to be careful watching recent stuff. I, I must admit, it, it it will slip in. Uh, yeah. So the collection is, as I say, all, all that kind of stuff. I really, really love like seventies and late sixties, French and American and crime, crime pictures. I just, you know, the sorcerer, the freaking one was, I thought was genius. I think. Yeah. That gets a, that gets a spin nearly every year in my house. Yeah. It's just one of the greatest sort of crimes of, you know, like misfortunes of, of film, you know, cause it's such a wonderful film, but came out at the same time as star Wars had this yeah. name the director of The Exorcist directing The Sorcerer. So, of course, everyone's expecting a horror movie. Yeah. Uh, so you have those two huge things going against you. Plus, it's kind of an anti-hero, weird, downbeat film anyway, at a time when suddenly temples have literally been invented that year, you know. So so it's it's a tricky one, but, God, it's a good one. You know, things like that and The Seven Ups and uh, you know, French Connection and all those sort of pictures, Charlie Barrick, and I just love them. I love them to pieces. Jeez, oh, uh, the Seven Ups! Wow, they are one of the one of the characters. The Aussie character from Seven Up lives not far from me. <laughs> really fantastic. Yeah. Um, so the other question I wanted to ask was, like you mentioned, stunt work. You, you've you've been in the stunt field for a long time, and you've worked with some incredible filmmakers doing that. What's the hairiest stunt that you can think you've ever performed? Uh, on Mars Attacks. I did uh, when when the aliens go into Jack Nicholson's bunker, they start blowing things up, and I did I did an explosion on fire, which was an air ram, which is a nitrogen ram that you, you, is yeah. triggered as the as the pyrotechnic goes off, the air ram is triggered. Or I, I, I think it was actually when I stepped on and triggered it, that fired me up into the air, and I came down on a staircase and then came down the staircase. Oh my god! So it, was, it was a triple bang with the fire, the air ram, and the stairfall. Uh, and you, but you're young and you're dumb and you're 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 strong as nails when you're in your twenties and it's sort of you know you've been training for that stuff like crazy anyway so you don't you know it's more an incredible rush and and you feel wonderful afterwards. It was particularly good for me as a stunt man. You get paid on the get you get you get the daily rate, but then you get a little bump for the stunt, mm. which works if you go overtime. For example, you're over ten hours that that bump increases mm. your overtime. So. You're also looking to do a bit of overtime and a, and a stunt bump is a good thing. Anyway, that was Jack Nicholson's last day. So it ended up being like a 19 or 20 hour day. So oh, wow. it was, I think it was my best day ever as well. At that oh, yes. Single day that. financially, uh, but it was a good stunt. Going into water with the sharks and Cutthroat Island, we went in from quite high up. Mm. Uh, out at, out, you know, in the uh, China Sea, and they, they had this, the grey reef shark, which is not inherently dangerous unless you actually kick it or land on it. Uh, and they're feeding, you know, they're doing the craft service and all the food's falling in the water. So about by about lunchtime or one o'clock, 
you're just seeing all the fins everywhere with the little black tip on them. Oh, and they're, they're, my God. You know, you know the, the Thai craft service, th or well, anyone, they're throwing it all in the sea, you know, so they're everywhere. And then going in the water, you're trying to find where there aren't sharks to land. <laughs> <laughs> So it was a, it was a, uh, that was an interesting experience. No one, no one, I think one person got, got something on the side of their leg, a little cut, but we're not sure if it was a sword or, a, or, or. Oh a my credit. goodness. Um, and, and one, like one movie you've done stunts on, I believe is one of my favorite films is War of the Worlds, um, Spielberg film. Um, so yeah, yeah. Was that a great shoot? Like, cause I mean, the stunts in that I imagine would be phenomenal. I, I think it's one of the most intense movies ever. Yeah. That was Vic uh, Armstrong's, yeah. Uh, stunt coordinating who you know is my uncle and i just loved working with him he's so good and came up old school he's still out there you know doing great work uh but but yeah it was fab to work on really really good we were in new jersey virginia all over the place mm. and then universal studios for the underwater stuff which was a lot of fun being plucked out of the water uh there's one moment we're in elizabeth new jersey in a tiny little cross section which is a cross section where the first or the audience's first experience of the uh the tripod coming out is uh, and the whole crowd comes in and they're, they're setting up a camera on a, on a, uh, uh, old New Jersey style fire escape, you know, the kind of the metal on the side of the building with the steps. And so I, I was sent up to go safety. Uh, I ran up there and there's Tom Cruise is up there sitting on the sofa beside Spielberg chatting. And you've got, uh, Janusz Kaminski there. It's a tiny little apartment, you know, a New Jersey, New York style. You imagine mm -hmm. it out of your head, like those 1930s films you saw. And so I'm just standing there by by the balcony and I looked across the room and then the tiny little kitchen, there's the whole family of about five there and they're watching Tom Cruise and Spielberg and you, and you can see on their face, they're like, nobody is going to believe us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and My that was God. An interesting moment. But yeah, it was a brilliant one. Lots of good I, stuff. I reckon that's his most underappreciated film. I just think it's fantastic. Um... My first full, full burn on that one, like foot, foot to head, uh, when the big explosion happened and they're blowing stuff out. Unfortunately, the burns got cut out because they looked too violent, which was an unfortunate thing, but it was okay. a good burn. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I hope there's footage of it somewhere, at least, in out there in the world. <laughs> uh, final question for you, because this one really piqued my interest. Um, I did see that you're involved with the Pen Dragon Cycle, the new um, Bonfire Daily Wire production, and I love what those guys are putting out. Um, is that true? You, you've worked on that? <laughs> Yeah, no, I was, I, I was in Spain on a film that had fallen through during the strike. And I, I was it's like, oh, dear, what am I going to do? Because I'd been there nine weeks. It was pretty bad. And the telephone rang. It was Dallas Sonnier, who's producing yep. that show, <laughs> said, you, you don't, you're not interested in coming to Budapest by any chance, are you? I said, well, that's a funny thing you say. I can be there in about two and a half hours. <laughs> so I flew straight there and I met them. They had two directors on it uh, uh, and they felt they needed a third it, it, they, they'd underestimated how difficult it was going to be uh yeah. they hit my trailer for Boudicca that morning which is a similar era there's a set about 400 AD yeah and they said would you be interested and and so I ended up staying for four months on it and it was absolutely wow. wonderful I, I just yeah um Dallas is one of my favorite sort of producer filmmakers and I've had him on my podcast and and he's fantastic to chat to and I just think the stuff he's putting out is really edgy and raw and yeah just I love he's extraordinarily intelligent very very yeah. smart and a really good guy and yeah. i i you know that that saved my bacon that one did it was a a really really helpful and it was a lot of fun i got to play with you know 50 horsemen and yeah uh, lots and lots of special effects and stunts and castles and i you know went from southern italy all the way through to the to the dolomite mountains and grand sasso and then into budapest where i've worked before the most most exciting adventure imaginable i just really yeah. loved it and i hope it's a good show I, I i wasn't one of the creators on the show yeah uh i i did my very best with what, what i had and you know got some great performances you know really and some really cinematic imagery and you know they're cut they're putting it all together now it's the, yeah it's, yeah um yeah I, the, the whole gang jeremy big. and all that i love the, yeah. i love their stuff um and i'm glad you're involved with it like i can't wait to see that but um i wanted to thank you for having a chat with me because um like i said love your work so it's a little bit of a fanboy moment for me thank you very much it's uh it's a great honor to be on and hopefully uh the australian audiences like Boudicca, you know i think you've sold it good good <laughs> Welcome to Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. We're so back 
so happy to be back is what I'm supposed to be saying. I don't know. It's all <laughs> back to it's be the, happy. Back to be. It's upside down down there. It's their winter during their summer. It makes no sense. Or is it summer during the winter? I don't know. They're the only people I know to go for a Christmas swim. If Bluey has taught me anything. We're excited to be back. And this topic was brought to you by Chad Jennings. Chad, what is it? <laughs> it is basically uh, what are some of the best gruesome deaths in movie history? Now, we're going to be doing an extended version of this for Bonehead Weekly, but for me, one of the ones I won't be talking about on there is the death of, <clears throat> it's weird, it's Uncle Frank, but it's Andy Robinson as Larry, who is the dad of Ashley Ron Lawrence Christie in Hellraiser. But at the end of it, when all of the chains have him, and he is about to be ripped apart in his dead brother's skin. And he has, recites the shortest Bible verse in the whole Bible. Jesus wept. It's good stuff. <laughs> it is a good one. I mean, Hellraiser to me is one of those very flawed films. Oh, yeah. That has so many good scenes and shots in it. It just works despite the fact that it makes no bleeding sense. I just love Jesus wept. And he's smiling as it happens. <laughs> Chad, James, one of you, go. James, you go, bud. You know, I don't think about this film often, but when you thought about a gruesome death, it popped into my head because you started there's nothing, it. nothing that says, boy, this ain't going to end well when you're tied between a truck and somebody's going to tear you in half. Oh, God. The Hitcher yeah. uh, may have one of the best gruesome deaths because you think maybe, maybe that's not going to happen. Maybe that negotiation is going to go really well. She I've she don't got, make it. I got bad news for you. He uh, she was going to be taller, but then something just gave out. She don't make it. You, th I'm with you. It's a good scene because and written by Eric Red. Uh, you think ah, oh, they're not going to kill the love it. Oh, there she went. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's it all is. it's all off screen. Yeah, there she yep. went. Ugh. It works really well though. Yep. So much that it it, it stuck that and the fa French fry scene stuck with me for to for decades. I Still seen, does. I need to go back and watch it, Chad. So it it just kind of this is one of those segments where James and I are on that same wavelength again because I too am going to pull from a Rucker Hauer film. Is it Blind Justice? Oh no, it's Hobo with a Shotgun. Ah, that's good. That's good. Uh, specifically. The time where the mobster puts the 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 man in the the pothole and and gets his head wrapped around the 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 pothole the, the 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 cover wraps it with a rope ties the rope to a truck and the truck just pulls off and off goes the guy's head when the head comes up a gusher of blood and then you know you think that's that's good you don't have to go there but no then comes the lady with the fur coat and bikini. And then does a full on blood bath, just takes a blood bath right there, rubbing it all over her. I don't, uh, that was uh, one of the ones that I was not going to mention. So I was like, oh, this goes great for Lynn and Ben. I don't know that I remember anything other than him with the scene and it was in the trailer. And I know I watched it. I think I watched it with you all, but I don't yeah. think I remember anything about the movie except him talking to the priest at the confession. Oh, there oh, are no, I remember just a hobo the, with a shot. Talking to the baby. They don't deserve to be born into a world like this. Somebody's yeah. got, yeah, that that scene I remember really well. And I, you're, there, right, you're right, Chad. There are several scenes I'm with a shotgun, but no, just the fact that that one ends with a lady just jumping in the middle of the stream and just, just going full on gyration. Mm, that's what I do. Mm. This has been Bonehead Weekly Fun Size. Welcome back, Australia. They never went anywhere we did. Oh, the sun revolves around us. That's why I've got melanoma. <laughs> oh, it's good to have the boneheads back. It's good to have everybody back. I'm I'm so glad to be back. <laughs> I feel like we're the Blues Brothers, and we've just we've just played a gig at the at the uh, the we're the good old Blues Brothers, and boys. we put the band back together. <laughs> Run a mission from Gad. Yes, um, th that my Amer American accents, my accents at this show are really <laughs> suck balls. I was about to say that explains the fucking cyclone I fence between. Couldn't us. Even, yeah, couldn't even do the, <laughs> couldn't even do the Blues Brothers were on a mission from God proper. <laughs> they should Horrible. do Bl Blues Brothers Aussie style. 
how good would that be? Yeah. Be, but didn't they didn't they try it with uh, Paul Hogan and uh, oh, gosh, did Kenny? Or, no, was it? Uh, <laughs> That's strange yeah. bedfellows. No, no, or, no, uh, no, that was one of Michael Kane. Michael, You're thinking uh, of um, Charlie Boots. Charlie Boots. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for Charlie Pants. All righty. Um, recommendations, Ben. It's been a while. It has been a while. Yes. But there's always... Something to recommend. It's always a little gem <laughs> that you uh, put off watching for, for 30, 40 years, and then you're watching, you're like, why did I take so long to watch this? Well, and then you get to recommend it. Well, let me do mine, because mine was 1965, and I'd never seen it until now. Uh, and once again... Is it Darling? I purchased it in that same JB purchase we went to, ah, you know, a, a few so months not, ago. I've been working on Darling for Umbrella, <laughs> which, are, which we haven't announced yet. <laughs> and it's 1965, so I'm shocked. <laughs> Well, they know now. They know now. <laughs> uh, Bunny Lake is missing, which is the uh, the movie. Oh, do you remember Otto you uh, and oh, I, I almost don't want you to tell me too much because I bought this ages I ago. Won't, on I won't the give Arrow. anything away because it is a movie that could be spoiled with one syllable. One thing, yeah, um, I but I won't. The Arrow sale, and I haven't got around to I watching won't. it. I can just say it's fantastic. It it's really Hitchcocky and comes from that era. It's sort of not long after Psycho, so it's got that kind of psychological feel to it. It's uh, Lawrence Olivier is in it. Uh, Carol Lindley and a kid. Um, Dahlia. Dahlia. Dahlia from um, 2001. Yes. And it, it's essentially a riff on The Lady Vanishes. So it's it's about a mother that drops her kid off at childcare in the morning when she goes to pick him up or her, uh, when she goes to pick her up in the afternoon. The child's not there. The school doesn't remember her being there, doesn't even know the name of the child. And it's like the child's just gone. So Bunny Lake is missing. Yeah, it's like a gaslighting movie. Pretty much. Um, kind of. Like, you know, it, it's not... That's the dog outside the door. If you if you can hear that <laughs> squeaky toy, <laughs> um, but look, I don't want to give anything away. So I'm trying to think. The investigation is the real fun part of this. Ooh, you got I'm Lawrence, watch this movie this weekend. Lawrence Olivier adds some humour to this because he's kind of not taking the mother seriously, thinking she's a bit of a psycho herself. Um, so he's throwing humour at the situation. You've got. Um, Kia, who plays the brother of Bunny Lake's mother, so the uncle, who's getting really fucking mad that no one's actually paying attention to this, and he sort of puts the the um the strong man sort of um he's almost like a henchman the way he comes about things, you know, yeah, trying right. to get you know justice, and that's all I'll say. Except that it's atmospheric. It could have been directed by Hitchcock for all we know, but Preminger's a pretty good director, yeah. so you know. <laughs> yeah, no slouch. That's Preminger right. ain't no slouch. Yeah, and look, I just wish I'd watched this earlier. Like, I mean, I'd love discovering it this late down but the back line. Back in '65. Oh, look, I think it would have blown my mind. I think it's ahead yeah. of its time, that's for sure. Uh, then I'll leave it at that. So, Bunny Lake is missing. The Cinema Cult Blu-ray was only like three dollars fifty at um at the good old JB. So they may still have it on sale. Go look for go, it. Go go track it down. There you, oh, you can get it on Blu-ray from Arrow. Oh, there you go. As well. Yeah. Cool. If you want to. All right. So that's my recommendation. Your recommendation. Yours? Look, I have had not seen this movie before, uh, which is, I'm sure, is a surprise to, to no one, <laughs> to everyone, to no one. Depends what uh, it is. It is. It's 1989's Intruder, the Scott oh, Spiegel film. Fuck yes. Which I've had. I've had the Synapse Blu-ray for God knows how long. Mm -hmm. uh, I finally decided to watch it. Fuck, it's good. It is fantastic. It is a lot of, like, the kills, like, there's so many great, gory kills. Basically, the premise of the film is, it's this supermarket in, I think it's in Los Angeles. They don't really specify. Anywhere in America. It's a supermarket, in, yeah, yeah, somewhere in America. And it's, the store is closed, and it's the night shifter there, kind of, doing all of the restocking and stuff like that. And a killer breaks in and picks them <laughs> off one by one. It is such a great use of single space. Yeah. Um, very much, it's a slasher film, but unlike most slasher films. The thing that's so amazing about it, though, is that this supermarket has so many nooks and crannies <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> in it. And like this, it, you know, it, 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 it's just a, like an mean, amazing, and it's an amazing set. And, and they Scott Spiegel made this right off the success of Evil Dead because he was, you know, yeah, the writer. Well, of, I think while they were still... yeah. Fucking around with Evil Dead. You got Bruce Campbell in there, and Bruce yeah. Campbell turns up. Lawrence Bender is a co-producer who Raimi. turns up in it. Sam Raimi's in it. Ted Raimi's in it. Yeah. Uh, my favorite is that uh, Renee Estevez, who I like to I like to think of as the lost sheen, the missing <laughs> sheen, uh, turns up. Although she's only, you know, it's weird because if you look at it, if you look up this film on IMDb, she's like the second lead or the second name on the list, but she's literally the first kill. 
So I hope I'm not spoiling anything. <laughs> but she, she no. does not. She's not in the film much. Um, but it's just such a fun, really fun. Like, and it has that really kind of neon saturated kind of eighties, you know, slash of kind of vibe to it. Like 100%. it is just like you watching, and it, like you could you do. It does have a bit of that Evil Dead Two kind of feel. Has a lot of like um, frenzy it. and insanity going on. Uh, what I love about this film is when you watch it now, you can see so much of its influence in other movies. Yeah. You know, whether it's that um, Black Christmas from the other year or whatever, yeah. anything that's in a shop. Yeah. Uh, even like Equalize when they went to Bunnings. I'm like, all I kept yeah. thinking was like, you know, this yeah, is it's intruder. totally like Intruder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, uh, great choice. Yeah. It's I want to get it, my hands on a Blu ray. I've got the DVD, but not the, not the Blu ray. Well, yeah, look, Synapse have a great one out. Cool. And, uh, who knows? Maybe a local distributor I, will finally release. I don't think it's got an Australian release since VHS. No, I've, I've got it right behind you there. Oh, yeah, DVD. Yeah. Oh, Beyond did it. Yes. Okay. It's the director's cut. Yeah. And uh, this is a uh, <laughs> no, because it's Big Sky. That's right. I did look this up <laughs> on the internet, and of course, it's back in the day when the special features included scene selection, <laughs> and it's got a weird cover. I mean, it's not an unattractive cover, but it's not the original poster, that's for sure. No, and I love that Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi have top billing, whereas <laughs> Bruce Campbell is in it for like five minutes, max. Who was in Black uh, Black Sunday, or whatever it was called, Black uh, Saturday? Black Saturday, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. I also love Scott Spiegel as a director. Like, a lot of people either don't know him or don't know him well enough, but I think if you really dive into his stuff, at first glance, his films are kind of, you know, cheap and shoddy, like, for example, From Dust to Dawn 2. No, but they're not. That's yeah, okay. And yeah. that's, I think, a fantastic sequel. And before the controversy, and I think I've said this on the show before, um, Harvey Weinstein from Miramax said that from Dust to Dawn two, from Dust to Dawn two, was the best DTV release they've ever made. Yeah, and I can see why. It's artistic. It's creative. It's like really, really fun. Yeah, Bruce Campbell's in it. Bruce Campbell's in he it. He did Hostel three. He's done a Spring Break movie that never got released. It's like a lost movie. He's fantastic. My name is Modesty. My name is Modesty. The best Modesty Blaze film mm-hmm. to date. <laughs> it's the only one, isn't it? It's the no. There's two. There's oh, the yeah, there's actual <laughs> Modesty Blaze. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's shit. Well, that's a great recommendation. I'm chuffed. You're welcome. And that brings us to the end of the show, mate. Yes, sir. Yes. A good first episode with no preparation. Well, minuscule preparation. I like that. It, I like that. It's we had three months to prep <laughs> oh, for this episode, <laughs> and then. Like, admittedly, there are some things going on behind the scenes that led to this being at the drop of the hat. Yeah. Uh, but I, look, I, still had, I still had fun. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, missed, I missed doing the show. I th- I've really missed doing the show. And you said to me right as we ended last year, it'll only be a couple of weeks before I'm back on the... <laughs> and I deliberately <laughs> didn't get in touch with you. I was antsy about it. I'm like, I really, really fucking want to do this. Um, so what I have been doing is I've been planning a few things with Chloe for the Up Late Show, right. giving, giving Ben a bit of a break. Um, but I've been dying to get back into this. <laughs> and the, the second that I knew I had to move house and location, I freaked out. I mean, I couldn't watch films. I couldn't prep anything. I couldn't catch up. So this literally is a spur of the moment thing for me as well. I'm glad we're settled. I'm glad we're back on the mic and I can't wait to do this every week. So good to be back and I hope you've all enjoyed the show. We're going to leave you with a song from the movie Argyle. It's a song called Do You Want a Funk? And it's by uh, Do you wanna funk with me? Patrick Cowley and featuring Sylvester. Not Stallone, but you know, that would have been, that that been, been great. Yeah, been great. <laughs> Can we just play Drinkenstein from uh, Ryan Stone? <laughs> Maybe. So that's Sylvester Stallone's greatest uh, musical uh, accomplishment. So don't forget to check out our social media platforms, all of them, goodmoviemonday.com. Drop us a comment. Get on board this year and interact with us. We're going to ask you questions on social media and we'll read them out in the show. The answers, that is. And uh, Anything else you want to add before we drop it? No, that's it, I think. Okay, see you next week. See you next week. <laughs>